Playbook, presenting you A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J. Moss. A Court of Thorns and Roses is a series by American author Sarah J. Moss, which follows the journey of Fair R. Karen after she is brought into the fairy lands of Prithian. The first book of the series, A Court of Thorns and Roses, was released in May 2015. The series centers on Fair's adventures across Prithian and the fairy courts, following the epic love story and fierce struggle that ensues after she enters the Fae Lands. The series is a New York Times bestseller and has been optioned by Hulu for a television series adaptation by Ronald D. Moore. This is a romance, fantasy book series. Other book of this series are A Court of Mist and Fury, 2016 A Court of Wings and Ruin, 2017 a Court of Frost and Starlight, 2018. A Court of Silver Flames, 2021. We are thinking about continuing this series. If we get enough response, we will continue the series. Please show some love on this video. Now we should go into the story. This is second part of A Court of Thrones and Roses story series. If you missed first part of this romance series, please check out our description, or, our, playbook YouTube channel. Chapter 17 I jerked awake in the middle of the night, panting. My dreams had been filled with the clicking of the surreal's bone fingers, the grinning naga, and a pale, faceless woman dragging her blood-red nails across my throat, splitting me open bit by bit. She kept asking for my name, but every time I tried to speak, my blood bubbled out of the shallow wounds on my neck, choking me. I ran my hands through my sweat-damp hair. As my panting eased, a different sound filled the air, creeping in from the front hall, through the crack, beneath the door. Shouts, and someone screams. I was out of my bed in a heartbeat. The shouts weren't aggressive, but rather commanding, organizing. But the screaming. Every hair on my body stood upright as I flung open the door. I might have stayed and cowered, but I'd heard screams like that before, in the forest at home, when I didn't make a clean kill and the animals suffered. I couldn't stand it. And I had to know. I reached the top of the grand staircase in time to see the front doors of the manor bang open and Tamlin rush in, a screaming fairy slung over his shoulder. The fairy was almost as big as Tamlin, and yet the High Lord carried him as if he were no more than a sack of grain. Another species of the lesser fairies, with his blue skin, gangly limbs, pointed ears, and long onyx hair. But even from atop the stairs, I could see the blood gushing down the fairy's back, blood from the black stumps protruding from his shoulder blades. Blood that now soaked into Tamlin's green tunic in deep, shining splotches. One of the knives from his baldric was missing. Lucian rushed into the foyer below just as Tamlin shouted, The table, clear it off. Lucian shoved the vase of flowers off the long table in the center of the hall. Either Tamlin wasn't thinking straight, or he'd been afraid to waste the extra minutes bringing the fairy to the infirmary. Shattering glass set my feet moving, and I was halfway down the stairs, before Tamlin eased the shrieking fairy face first onto the table. The fairy wasn't wearing a mask, there was nothing to hide the agony contorting his long, unearthly features. Scouts found him dumped, just over the borderline, Tamlin explained to Lucian, but his eyes darted to me. They flashed with warning, but I took another step down. He said to Lucian, he's summer court. By the cauldron, Lucian said, surveying the damage. My wings, the fairy choked out, his glossy black eyes wide and staring at nothing. She took my wings. Again, that nameless she who haunted their lives. If she wasn't ruling the spring court, then perhaps she ruled another. Tamlin flicked a hand, and steaming water and bandages just appeared on the table. My mouth dried up, but I reached the bottom of the stairs and kept walking toward the table and the death that was surely hovering in this hall. She took my wings, said the fairy. She took my wings, he repeated, clutching the edge of the table with spindly blue fingers. Tamlin murmured a soft, wordless sound, gentle in a way I hadn't heard before, and picked up a rag to dunk in the water. I took up a spot across the table from Tamlin, and the breath whooshed from my chest as I beheld the damage. Whoever she was, she hadn't just taken his wings. She'd ripped them off. Blood oozed from the black velvety stumps on the fairy's back. 
The wounds were jagged, cartilage and tissue severed in what looked like uneven cuts. As if she'd sawed off his wings bit by bit. She took my wings, the fairy said again, his voice breaking. As he trembled, shock taking over, his skin shimmered with veins of pure gold, iridescent, like a blue butterfly. Keep still, Tamlin ordered, wringing the rag. You'll bleed out faster. And no, the fairy started, and began to twist onto his back, away from Tamlin, from the pain that was surely coming when that rag touched those raw stumps. It was instinct, or mercy, or desperation, perhaps, to grab the fairy's upper arms and shove him down again, pinning him to the table as gently as I could. He thrashed, strong enough that I had to concentrate solely on holding him. His skin was velvet smooth and slippery, a texture I would never be able to paint, not even if I had eternity to master it. But I pushed against him, gritting my teeth and willing him to stop. I looked to Lucian, but the color had blanched from his face, leaving a sickly white green in its wake. Lucian, Tamlin said, a quiet command. But Lucian kept gaping at the fairy's ruined back, at the stumps, his metal eye narrowing and widening, narrowing and widening. He backed up a step. And another. And then vomited in a potted plant, before sprinting from the room. The fairy twisted again and I held tight, my arms shaking with the effort. His injuries must have weakened him greatly if I could keep him pinned. Please, I breathed. Please hold still. She took my wings, the fairy sobbed, she took them. I know, I murmured, my fingers aching. I know. Tamlin touched the rag to one of the stumps, and the fairy screamed so loudly that my senses guttered, sending me staggering back. He tried to rise, but his arms buckled, and he collapsed face-first onto the table again. Blood gushed, so fast and bright that it took me a heartbeat to realize that a wound like this required a tourniquet, and that the fairy had lost far too much blood for it to even make a difference. It poured down his back and onto the table, where it ran to the edge and drip-drip-dripped to the floor near my feet. I found Tamlin's eyes on me. The wounds aren't clotting he said under his breath as the fairy panted. Can't you use your magic? I asked, wishing I could rip that mask off his face and see his full expression. Tamlin swallowed hard. No. Not for major damage. Once, but not any longer. The fairy on the table whimpered, his panting slowing. She took my wings, he whispered. Tamlin's green eyes flickered, and I knew, right then, that the fairy was going to die. Death wasn't just hovering in this hall, it was counting down the fairy's remaining heartbeats. I took one of the fairy's hands in mine. The skin there was almost leathery, and, perhaps more out of reflex than anything, his long fingers wrapped around mine, covering them completely. She took my wings, he said again, his shaking subsiding a bit. I brushed the long, damp hair from the fairy's half-turned face, revealing a pointed nose and a mouth full of sharp teeth. His dark eyes shifted to mine, beseeching, pleading. It will be all right, I said, and hoped he couldn't smell lies the way the surreal was able to. I stroked his limp hair, its texture like liquid night, another I would never be able to paint but would try to, perhaps forever. It will be all right. The fairy closed his eyes and I tightened my grip on his hand. Something wet touched my feet, and I didn't need to look down to see that his blood had pulled around me. My wings, the fairy whispered. You'll get them back. The fairy struggled to open his eyes. You swear? Yes, I breathed. The fairy managed a slight smile and closed his eyes again. My mouth trembled. I wished for something else to say, something more to offer him than my empty promises the first false vow I'd ever sworn. But Tamlin began speaking, and I glanced up to see him take the fairy's other hand. Cauldron save you, he said, reciting the words of a prayer that was probably older than the mortal realm. Mother hold you. Pass through the gates, and smell that immortal land of milk and honey. Fear no evil. Feel no pain. Tamlin's voice wavered, but he finished. Go, and enter eternity. The fairy heaved one final sigh, and his hand went limp in mine. I didn't let go, though, and kept stroking his hair, 
even when Tamlin released him and took a few steps from the table. I could feel Tamlin's eyes on me, but I wouldn't let go. I didn't know how long it took for a soul to fade from the body. I stood in the puddle of blood until it grew cold, holding the fairy's spindly hand and stroking his hair, wondering if he knew I'd lied when I'd sworn he would get his wings back, wondering if, wherever he had now gone, he had gotten them back. A clock chimed somewhere in the house, and Tamlin gripped my shoulder. I hadn't realized how cold I'd become until the heat of his hand warmed me through my nightgown. He's gone. Let him go. I studied the fairy's face, so unearthly, so inhuman. Who could be so cruel to hurt him like that? Fair, Tamlin said, squeezing my shoulder. I brushed the fairy's hair behind his long, pointed ear, wishing I'd known his name, and let go. Tamlin led me up the stairs, neither of us caring about the bloody footprints I left behind or the freezing blood soaking the front of my nightgown. I paused at the top of the steps, though, twisting out of his grip, and gazed at the table in the foyer below. We can't leave him there, I said, making to step down. Tamlin caught my elbow. I know, he said, the words so drained and weary. I was going to walk you upstairs first. Before he buried him. I want to go with you. It's too deadly at night for you two. I can hold my. No, he said, his green eyes flashing. I straightened, but he sighed, his shoulders curving inward. I must do this. Alone. His head was bowed. No claws, no fangs, there was nothing to be done against this enemy, this fate. No one for him to fight. So I nodded, because I would have wanted to do it alone, too, and turned toward my bedroom. Tamlin remained at the top of the stairs. Fair, he said, softly enough, that I faced him again. Why? He tilted his head to the side. You dislike our kind on a good day. And after Andres, even in the darkened hallway, his usually bright eyes were shadowed. So why? I took a step closer to him, my blood-covered feet sticking to the rug. I glanced down the stairs, to where I could still see the prone form of the fairy and the stumps of his wings. Because I wouldn't want to die alone, I said, and my voice wobbled as I looked at Tamlin again, forcing myself to meet his stare because I'd want someone to hold my hand until the end, and a while after that. That's something everyone deserves, human or fairy. I swallowed hard, my throat painfully tight. I regret what I did to Andres, I said, the words so strangled they were no more than a whisper. I regret that there was, such hate in my heart. I wish I could undo it, Anne. I'm sorry. So very sorry. I couldn't remember the last time, if ever, I'd spoken to anyone like that. But he just nodded and turned away, and I wondered if I should say more, if I should kneel and beg for his forgiveness, if he felt such grief, such guilt, over a stranger, then Andres. By the time I opened my mouth, he was already down the steps. I watched him, watched every movement he made, the muscles of his body visible through that blood-soaked tunic, watched that invisible weight bearing down on his shoulders. He didn't look at me as he scooped up the broken body and carried it to the garden doors, beyond my line of sight. I went to the window at the top of the stairs, watching as Tamlin carried the ferry through the moonlit garden and into the rolling fields. Beyond. He never once glanced back. Chapter 18 The next day, the blood of the ferry had been cleaned up by the time I ate, washed, and dressed. I'd taken my time in the morning, and it was nearly noon as I stood atop the staircase, peering down at the entry hall below. Just to make sure it was gone. I'd been set on finding Tamlin and explaining, truly explaining, how sorry I was about Andres. If I was supposed to stay here, stay with him, then I could at least attempt to repair what I'd ruined. I glanced to the large window behind me, the view so sweeping that I could see all the way to the reflecting pool beyond the garden. The water was still enough that the vibrant sky and fat, puffy clouds above were flawlessly reflected. Asking about them seemed vulgar after last night, but maybe, maybe once those paints and brushes did arrive, I could venture to the pool to capture it. 
I might have remained staring out toward that smear of color and light and texture had Tamlin and Lucian not emerged from another wing of the manor, discussing some border patrol or another. They fell silent as I came down the stairs, and Lucian strode right out the front door without so much as a good morning, just a casual wave. Not a vicious gesture, but he clearly had no intention of joining the conversation that Tamlin and I were about to have. I glanced around, hoping for any sign of those paints, but Tam pointed to the open front doors, through which Lucian had exited. Beyond them, I could see both of our horses, already saddled and waiting. Lucian was already climbing into the saddle of a third horse. I turned to Tamlin. Stay with him, he will keep me safe, and things will get better. Fine, I could do that. Where are we going? My words were half-mumbled. Your supplies won't arrive until tomorrow, and the gallery's being cleaned, and my meeting was postponed. Was he rambling? I thought we'd go for a ride, no killing involved. Or not good to worry about. Even as he finished with a half-smile, sorrow flickered in his eyes. Indeed, I'd had enough death in the past two days. Enough of killing fairies. Killing anything. No weapons were sheathed at his side or on his baldric but a knife hilt glinted at his boot. Where had he buried that fairy, a high lord digging a grave for a stranger? I might not have believed it if I'd been told, might not have believed it if he hadn't offered me sanctuary rather than death. Where to? I asked. He only smiled. I couldn't come up with any words when we arrived, and knew that even if I had been able to paint it, nothing would have done it justice. It wasn't simply that it was the most beautiful place I'd ever been to, or that it filled me with both longing and mirth, but it just seemed, right, as if the colors and lights and patterns of the world had come together to form one perfect place, one true bit of beauty. After last night, it was exactly where I needed to be. We sat atop a grassy knoll, overlooking a glade of oaks so wide and high they could have been the pillars and spires of an ancient castle. Shimmering tufts of dandelion fluff drifted by and the floor of the clearing was carpeted with swaying crocuses and snowdrops and bluebells. It was an hour or two past noon by the time we arrived, but the light was thick and golden. Though the three of us were alone, I could have sworn I heard singing. I hugged my knees and drank in the glen. We brought a blanket, Tamlin said, and I looked over my shoulder to see him jerk his chin to the purple blanket they'd laid out a few feet away. Lucian plopped down onto it and stretched his legs. Tamlin remained standing, waiting for my response. I shook my head and faced forward, tracing my hand through the feather-soft grass, cataloging its color and texture. I'd never felt grass like it, and I certainly wasn't going to ruin the experience by sitting on a blanket. Rushed whispers were exchanged behind me, and before I could turn around to investigate, Tamlin took a seat at my side. His jaw was clenched tight enough that I stared ahead. What is this place? I said, still running my fingers through the grass. Out of the corner of my eye, Tamlin was no more than a glittering golden figure. Just a glen. Behind us, Lucian snorted. Do you like it? Tamlin asked quickly. The green of his eyes matched the grass between my fingers, and the amber flecks were like the shafts of sunlight that streamed through the trees. Even his mask, odd and foreign, seemed to fit into the glen as if this place had been fashioned for him alone. I could picture him here in his beast form, curled up in the grass, dozing. What? I said. I'd forgotten his question. Do you like it? He repeated, and his lips tugged into a smile. I took an uneven breath and stared at the glen again. Yes. He chuckled. That's it? Yes? Would you like me to grovel with gratitude for bringing me here, High Lord? Ah. The surreal told you nothing important, did it? That smile of his sparked something bold in my chest. He also said that you like being brushed, and if I'm a clever girl, I might train you with treats. Tamlin tipped his head to the sky and roared with laughter. Despite myself, I let out a soft laugh. I might die of surprise, Lucian said behind me. You made a joke, fair. I turned to look at him with a cool smile. You don't want to know what the surreal said. About you. 
I flicked my brows up, and Lucian lifted his hands in defeat. I'd pay good money to hear what the surreal thinks of Lucian, Tamlin said. A cork pop, followed by the sounds of Lucian chugging the bottle's contents and chuckling with a muttered, brushed. Tamlin's eyes were still bright with laughter as he put a hand at my elbow, pulling me to my feet. Come on, he said, jerking his head down the hill to the little stream that ran along its base. I want to show you something. I got to my feet, but Lucian remained sitting on the blanket and lifted the bottle of wine in salute. He took a slug from it as he sprawled on his back and gazed at the green canopy. Each of Tamlin's movements was precise and efficient, his powerfully muscled legs eating up the earth as we wove between the towering trees, hopped over tiny brooks, and clambered up steep knolls. We stopped atop a mound, and my hands slackened at my sides. There, in a clearing surrounded by towering trees, lay a sparkling silver pool. Even from a distance, I could tell that it wasn't water, but something more rare and infinitely more precious. Tamlin grasped my wrist and tugged me down the hill, his calloused fingers gently scraping against my skin. He let go of me to leap over the root of the tree in a single maneuver and prowled to the water's edge. I could only grind my teeth as I stumbled after him, heaving myself over the root. He crouched by the pool and cupped his hand to fill it. He tilted his hand, letting the water fall. Have a look. The silvery sparkling water that dribbled from his hand set ripples dancing across the pool, each glimmering with various colors, and, that looks like starlight, I breathed. He huffed a laugh, filling and emptying his hand again. I gaped at the glittering water. It is starlight. That's impossible, I said, fighting the urge to take a step toward the water. This is Prithian. According to your legends, nothing is impossible. How? I asked, unable to take my eyes from the pool, the silver, but also the blue and red and pink and yellow glinting beneath, the lightness of it. I don't know, I never asked, and no one ever explained. When I continued gaping at the pool, he laughed, drawing away my attention, only for me to find him unbuttoning his tunic. Jump in, he said, the invitation dancing in his eyes. A swim, unclothed, alone. With a high lord. I shook my head, falling back a step. His fingers paused at the second button from his collar. Don't you want to know what it's like? I didn't know what he meant, swimming in starlight, or swimming with him. I, no. All right. He left his tunic unbuttoned. There was only bare, muscled, golden skin. Beneath. Why this place? I asked, tearing my eyes away from his chest. This was my favorite haunt as a boy. Which was when? I couldn't stop the question from coming out. He cut a glance in my direction, a very long time ago. He said it so quietly that it made me shift on my feet. A very long time ago indeed, if he'd been a boy during the war. Well, I'd started down that road, so I ventured to ask, is Lucian all right? After last night, I mean. He seemed back to his usual snide, irreverent self, but he'd vomited at the sight of that dying fairy. He, didn't react well. Tamlin shrugged, but his words were soft as he said, Lucian. Lucian has endured things that make times like last night, difficult. Not just the scar and the eye, though I bet last night brought back memories of that, too. Tamlin rubbed at his neck, then met my stare. Such an ancient heaviness in his eyes, in the set of his jaw. Lucian is the youngest son of the High Lord of the Autumn Court. I straightened. The youngest of seven brothers. The Autumn Court is, cutthroat. Beautiful, but his brothers see each other only as competition since the strongest of them will inherit the title, not the eldest. It is the same throughout Prithian, at every court. Lucian never cared about it, never expected to be crowned High Lord, so he spent his youth doing everything a High Lord's son probably shouldn't, wandering the courts, making friends with the sons of other High Lords, a faint gleam in Tamlin's eyes at that. And being with females who were a far cry from the nobility of the Autumn Court. Tamlin paused for a moment, and I could almost feel the sorrow before he said, Lucian fell in love with a fairy whom his father considered to be grossly inappropriate for someone of his bloodline. 
Lucian said he didn't care that she wasn't one of the high fae, that he was certain the mating bond would snap into place soon and that he was going to marry her and leave his father's court to his scheming brothers. A tight sigh. His father had her put down. Executed, in front of Lucian, as his two eldest brothers held him and made him watch. My stomach turned, and I pushed a hand against my chest. I couldn't imagine, couldn't comprehend that sort of loss. Lucian left. He cursed his father, abandoned his title and the autumn court, and walked out. And without his title protecting him, his brothers thought to eliminate one more contender to the High Lord's crown. Three of them went out to kill him, one came back. Lucian, killed them? He killed one, Tamlin said. I killed the other, as they had crossed into my territory. And I was now, High Lord, and could do what I wanted with trespassers, threatening the peace of my lands. A cold, brutal statement. I claimed Lucian as my own, named him emissary, since he'd already made many friends across the courts and had always been good at talking to people, while I, can find it difficult. He's been here ever since. As emissary, I began, has he ever had dealings with his father? Or his brothers? Yes. His father has never apologized, and his brothers are too frightened of me to risk harming him. No arrogance in those words, just icy truth, but he has never forgotten what they did to her, or what his brothers tried to do to him. Even if he pretends that he has. It didn't quite excuse everything Lucian had said and done to me, but. I understood now. I could understand the walls and barriers he had no doubt constructed around himself. My chest was too tight, too small to fit the ache building in it. I looked at the pool of glittering starlight and let out a heavy breath. I needed to change the subject. What would happen if I were to drink the water? Tamlin straightened a bit, then relaxed, as if glad to release that old sadness. Legend claims you'd be happy until your last breath. He added, perhaps we'd both need a glass. I don't think that entire pool would be enough for me, I said and he laughed. Two jokes in one day, a miracle sent from the cauldron, he said. I cracked a smile. He came a step closer, as if forcibly leaving behind the dark, sad stain of what had happened to Lucian, and the starlight danced in his eyes as he said, what would be enough to make you happy? I blushed from my neck to the top of my head, I, I don't know. It was true. I'd never given that sort of thing any thought beyond getting my sister safely married off and having enough food for me and my father, and time to learn to paint. Hmm, he said, not stepping away. What about the ringing of bluebells? Or a ribbon of sunshine? Or a garland of moonlight? He grinned wickedly. High Lord of Prithian, indeed. High Lord of Foolery was more like it. And he knew. He knew I'd say no, that I'd squirm a bit, from merely being alone with him. No. I wouldn't let him have the satisfaction of embarrassing me. I'd had enough of that lately, enough of, of that girl encased in ice and bitterness. So I gave him a sweet smile, doing my best to pretend that my stomach wasn't flipping over itself. A swim sounds delightful. I didn't allow myself room for second guessing. And I took no small amount of pride in the fact that my fingers didn't tremble once as I removed my boots, then unbuttoned my tunic and pants and shucked them onto the grass. My undergarments were modest enough that I wasn't showing much, but I still looked straight at him as I stood on the grassy bank. The air was warm and mild, and a soft breeze kissed its way across my bare stomach. Slowly, so slowly, his eyes roved down, then up. As if he were studying every inch, every curve of me. And even though I wore my ivory underthings, that gaze alone stripped me bare. His eyes met mine and he gave me a lazy smile, before removing his clothes. Button by button. I could have sworn the gleam in his eyes turned hungry and feral, enough so that I had to look anywhere but at his face. I let myself indulge in the glimpse of a broad chest, arms corded with muscle, and long, strong legs before I walked right into that pool. He wasn't built like Isaac whose body had very much still been in that gangly place between boy and man. No, Tamlin's glorious. Body was honed by centuries of fighting and brutality. 
The liquid was delightfully warm, and I strode in until it was deep enough to swim out a few strokes and casually tread in place. Not water, but something smoother, thicker. Not oil, but something purer, thinner. Like being wrapped in warm silk. I was so busy savoring the tug of my fingers through the silvery substance that I didn't notice him until he was treading beside me. Who taught you to swim, he asked, and dumped his head under the surface. When he came up, he was grinning, sparkling streams of starlight running along the contours of his mask. I didn't go under, didn't quite know if he'd been joking about the water making me mirthful if I drank it. When I was twelve, I watched the village children swimming at a pond and figured it out myself. It had been one of the most terrifying experiences of my life, and I'd swallowed half the pond in the process, but I'd gotten the gist of it, managed to conquer my blind panic and terror and trust myself. Knowing how to swim had seemed like a vital ability, one that might someday mean the difference between life and death. I'd never expected it would lead to this, though. He went under again, and when he emerged, he ran a hand through his golden hair. How did your father lose his fortune? How'd you know about that? Tamlin snorted. I don't think born peasants have your kind of diction. Some part of me wanted to come up with a comment about snobbery, but, well, he was right, and I couldn't blame him for being a skilled observer. My father was called the Prince of Merchants, I said plainly, treading that silky, strange water. I hardly had to put any effort into it, the water was so warm, so light, that it felt as if I were floating in air every ache in my body oozing away into nothing. But that title, which he'd inherited from his father, and his father before that, was a lie. We were just a good name that masked three generations of bad debts. My father had been trying to find a way to ease those debts for years, and when he found an opportunity to pay them off, he took it, regardless of the risks. I swallowed. Eight years ago, he amassed our wealth on three ships to sail to Barat for invaluable spices and cloth. Tamlin frowned. Risky indeed. Those waters are a death trap, unless you go the long way. Well, he didn't go the long way. It would have taken too much time, and our creditors were breathing down his neck. So he risked sending the ships directly to Barat. They never reached Barat's shores. I tipped my hair back in the water clearing the memory of my father's face, the day that news arrived of the sinking. When the ship sank, the creditors circled him like wolves. They ripped him apart until there was nothing left of him but a broken name and a few gold pieces to purchase that cottage. I was eleven. My father, he just stopped trying after that. I couldn't bring myself to mention that final, ugly moment when that other creditor had come with his cronies to wreck my father's leg. That's when you started hunting? No, even though we moved to the cottage, it took almost three years for the money to entirely run out, I said. I started hunting when I was fourteen. His eyes twinkled, no trace of the warrior forced to accept a high lord's burden. And here you are. What else did you figure out for yourself? Maybe it was the enchanted pool, or maybe it was the genuine interest behind the question, but I smiled and told him about those years in the woods. Tired, but surprisingly, content from a few hours of swimming and eating and lounging in the glen, I eyed Lucian as we rode back to the manor that afternoon. We were crossing a broad meadow of new spring grass when he caught me glancing at him for the tenth time, and I braced myself as he fell back from Tamlin's side. The metal I narrowed on me while the other remained wary, unimpressed. Yes? That was enough to persuade me not to say anything about his past. I would hate pity too. And he didn't know me, not well enough to warrant anything but resentment if I brought it up, even if it weighed on me to know it, to grieve for him. I waited until Tamlin was far enough ahead that even his high fay hearing might not pick up on my words. I never got to thank you for your advice with the surreal. Lucy tensed. Oh? I looked ahead at the easy way Tamlin rode, the horse utterly unbothered by his mighty rider. If you still want me dead, I said, you might have to try a bit harder. Lucian loosed a breath. That's not what I intended. I gave him a long look. I wouldn't shed any tears, he amended. I knew it was true. But what happened to you? I was joking, I said, and gave him a little smile. 
you can't possibly forgive me that easily for sending you into danger. No. And part of me would like nothing more than to wallop you for your lack of warning about the surreal. But I understand, I'm a human who killed your friend, who now lives in your house, and you have to deal with me. I understand, I said again. He was quiet for long enough that I thought he wouldn't reply. Just as I was about to move ahead, he spoke. Tam told me that your first shot was to save the surreal's life. Not your own. It seemed like the right thing to do. The look he gave me was more contemplative than any he'd given me before. I know far too many high fey and lesser fairies who wouldn't have seen it that way, or bothered. He reached for something at his side and tossed it to me. I had to fight to stay in the saddle as I fumbled for it, a jeweled hunting knife. I heard you scream, he said as I examined the blade in my hands. I'd never held one so finely crafted, so perfectly balanced. And I hesitated. Not long, but I hesitated before I came running. Even though Tam got there in time, I still broke my word in those seconds I waited. He jerked his chin at the knife. It's yours. Don't bury it in my back, please. Chapter 19 The next morning, my paint and supplies arrived from wherever Tamlin or the servants had dug them up, but before Tamlin let me see them, he brought me down hall after hall until we were in a wing of the house I'd never been to, even in my nocturnal exploring. I knew where we were going without his having to say. The marble floors shone so brightly that they had to have been freshly mopped, and that rose-scented breeze floated in through the opened windows. All this, he'd done this for me. As if I would have cared about cobwebs or dust. When he paused before a set of wooden doors, the slight smile he gave me was enough to make me blurt. Why do anything, anything this kind? The smile faltered. It's been a long time since there was anyone here who appreciated these things. I like seeing them used again. Especially when there was such blood and death in every other part of his life. He opened the gallery doors, and the breath was knocked from me. The pale wooden floors gleamed in the clean, bright light pouring in from the windows. The room was empty save for a few large chairs and benches for viewing the, the. I barely registered moving into the long gallery, one hand absent-mindedly wrapping around my throat as I looked up at the paintings. So many, so different, yet all arranged to flow together seamlessly. Such different views and snippets and angles of the world. Pastorals, portraits, still lives, each a story and an experience, each a voice shouting or whispering or singing about what that moment, that feeling, had been like, each a cry into the void of time that they had been here, had existed. Some had been painted through eyes like mine, artists who saw in colors and shapes I understood. Some showcased colors I had not considered, these had a bend to the world that told me a different set of eyes had painted them. A portal into the mind of a creature so unlike me, and yet, and yet I looked at its work and understood and felt, and cared. I never knew, Tamlin said from behind me, that humans were capable of, he trailed off as I turned, the hand I'd put on my throat sliding down to my chest, where my heart roared with a fierce sort of joy and grief and overwhelming humility, humility, before that magnificent art. He stood by the doors, head cocked in that animalistic way, the words still lost on his tongue. I wiped at my damp cheeks. It's, perfect, wonderful beyond my wildest imaginings didn't cover it. I kept my hand over my heart. Thank you, I said. It was all I could find to show him what these paintings, to be allowed into this room, meant. Come here whenever you want. I smiled at him, hardly able to contain the brightness in my heart. His returning smile was tentative, but shining, and then he left me to admire the gallery at my own leisure. I stayed for hours, stayed until I was drunk on the art, until I was dizzy with hunger and wandered out to find food. After lunch, Alice showed me to an empty room on the first floor with a table full of canvases of various sizes, brushes whose wooden handles gleamed in the perfect, clear light, and paints, so, so many paints, beyond the four basic ones I'd hoped for, that the breath was knocked from me again, and when Alice was gone and the room was quiet and waiting and utterly mine. Then I began to paint. Weeks passed, the days melting together. I painted and painted, most of it awful and useless. 
I never let anyone see it, no matter how much Tamlin prodded and Lucian smirked at my paint-splattered clothes, I never felt satisfied that my work matched the images burning in my mind. Often I painted from dawn until dusk, sometimes in that room, sometimes out in the garden. Occasionally, I'd take a break to explore the spring lands with Tamlin as my guide, coming back with fresh ideas that had me leaping out of bed the next morning to sketch or scribble down the scenes or colors as I'd glimpsed them. But there were the days when Tamlin was called away to face the latest threat to his borders, and even painting couldn't distract me until he returned, covered in blood that wasn't his own, sometimes in his beast form, sometimes as the High Lord. He never gave me details, and I didn't presume to ask about them, his safe return was enough. Around the manor itself, there was no sign of creatures like the Naga, or the Bog, but I stayed well away from the western woods, even though I painted them often enough from memory. And though my dreams continued to be plagued by the deaths I'd witnessed, the deaths I'd caused, and that horrible pale woman ripping me to shreds, all watched over by a shadow I could never quite glimpse, I slowly stopped being so afraid. Stay with the High Lord. You will be safe. So I did. The Spring Court was a land of rolling green hills and lush forests and clear, bottomless lakes. Magic didn't just abound in the bumps and the hollows, it grew there. Try as I might to paint it, I could never capture it, the feel of it. So sometimes I dared to paint the High Lord, who rode at my side when we wandered his grounds on lazy days, the High Lord, whom I was happy to talk to or spend hours in comfortable silence with. It was probably the lulling of magic that clouded my thoughts, and I didn't think of my family until I'd passed the outer hedge wall one morning, scouting for a new spot to paint. A breeze from the south ruffled my hair, fresh and warm. Spring was now dawning on the mortal world. My family, glamoured, cared for, safe, still had no idea where I was, the mortal world. It had moved on without me, as if I had never existed. A whisper of a miserable life. Gone, unremembered by anyone whom I'd known or cared for. I didn't paint, nor did I go riding with Tamlin that day. Instead, I sat before a blank canvas, no colors at all in my mind. No one would remember me back home, I was as good as dead to them. And Tamlin had let me forget them. Maybe the paints had even been a distraction, a way to get me to stop complaining, to stop being a pain in his ass about wanting to see my family, or maybe they were a distraction from whatever was happening with the Blight and Prithian. I'd stopped asking, just as the Surreal had ordered, like a stupid, useless, obedient human. It was an effort of stubborn will to make it through dinner. Tamlin and Lucian noticed my mood and kept conversation between themselves. It didn't do much for my growing rage, and when I had eaten my fill, I stalked into the moonlit garden and lost myself in its labyrinth of hedges and flower beds. I didn't care where I was going. After a while, I paused in the rose garden. The moonlight stained the red petals a deep purple and cast a silvery sheen on the white blooms. My father had this garden planted for my mother, Tamlin said from behind me. I didn't bother to face him. I dug my nails into my palms as he stopped by my side. It was a mating present. I stared at the flowers without seeing anything. The flowers I'd painted on the table at home were probably crumbling or gone by now. Nesta might have even scraped them off. My nails pricked the skin of my palms. Tamlin providing for them or no, glamouring their memories or no, I'd been erased from their lives. Forgotten. I'd let him erase me. He'd offered me paints and the space and time to practice, he'd shown me pools of starlight, he'd saved my life like some kind of feral knight in a legend, and I'd gulped it down like fairy wine. I was no better than those zealot children of the blessed. His mask was bronze in the darkness, and the emeralds glittered. You seem upset. I stalked to the nearest rose bush and ripped off a rose, my fingers tearing on the thorns. I ignored the pain, the warmth of the blood that trickled down, I could never paint it accurately, never render it the way those artists had in the gallery pieces. I would never be able to paint Ellen's little garden outside the cottage the way I remembered it, even if my family didn't remember me. He didn't reprimand me for taking one of his parents' roses, parents who were as absent as my own, but who had probably loved each other and loved him better than mine cared for me. A family that would have offered to go in his place if someone had come to steal him away. 
My fingers stung and ached, but I still held on to the rose as I said, I don't know why I feel so tremendously ashamed of myself for leaving them. Why it feels so selfish and horrible to paint. I shouldn't, shouldn't feel that way, should I? I know I shouldn't, but I can't help it. The rose hung limply from my fingers. All those years, what I did for them. And they didn't try to stop you from taking me. There it was, the giant pain that cracked me in two if I thought about it too long. I don't know why I expected them to. Why I believed that the puka's illusion was real that night. I don't know why I bother still thinking about it, or still caring. He was silent long enough that I added, compared to you, to your borders, and magic being weakened, I suppose my self-pity is absurd. If it grieves you, he said, the words caressing my bones, then I don't think it's absurd at all. Why? A flat question, and I chucked the rose into the bushes. He took my hands. His calloused fingers, strong and sturdy, were gentle as he lifted my bleeding hand to his mouth and kissed my palm. As if that were answer enough. His lips were smooth against my skin, his breath warm, and my knees buckled as he lifted my other hand to his mouth and kissed it, too. Kissed it carefully, in a way that made heat begin pounding in my core, between my legs. When he withdrew, my blood shone on his mouth. I glanced at my hands, which he still held, and found the wounds gone. I looked at his face again, at his gilded mask, the tanness of his skin, the red of his blood-covered lips as he murmured, don't feel bad for one moment about doing what brings you joy. He stepped closer, releasing one of my hands to tuck the rose I'd plucked behind my ear. I didn't know how it had gotten into his hand, or where the thorns had gone. I couldn't stop myself from pushing. Why, why do any of this? He leaned in closer, so close that I had to tip my head back to see him. Because your human joy fascinates me, the way you experience things, in your lifespan, so wildly and deeply and all at once, is, entrancing. I'm drawn to it, even when I know I shouldn't be, even when I try not to be. Because I was human, and I would grow old, and, I didn't let myself get that far as he came closer still. Slowly, as if giving me time to pull away, he brushed his lips against my cheek. Soft and warm and heartbreakingly gentle. It was hardly more than a caress before he straightened. I hadn't moved from the moment his mouth had met my skin. One day, one day there will be answers for everything, he said, releasing my hand and stepping away. But not until the time is right. Until it's safe. In the dark, his tone was enough to know that his eyes were flecked with bitterness. He left me, and I took a gasping breath, not realizing I'd been holding it. Not realizing that I craved his warmth, his nearness, until he was gone. Lingering mortification over what I'd admitted, what had, changed between us had me skulking out of the manor after breakfast, fleeing for the sanctuary of the woods for some fresh air, and to study the light and colors. I brought my bow and arrows, along with the jeweled hunting knife, that Lucian had given me. Better to be armed than caught empty-handed. I crept through the trees and brush for no more than an hour before I felt a presence behind me, coming ever closer, sending the animals running for cover. I smiled to myself, and twenty minutes later, I settled in the crook of a towering elm and waited. Brush rustled, hardly more than a breeze's passing, but I knew what to expect, knew the signs. A snap and roar of fury echoed across the lands, scattering the birds. When I climbed out of the tree and walked into the little clearing, I merely crossed my arms and looked up at the high lord, dangling by his legs from the snare I'd laid. Even upside down, he smiled lazily at me as I approached. Cruel human. That's what you get for stalking someone. He chuckled, and I came close enough to dare stroke a finger along the silken golden hair dangling just above my face, admiring the many colors within it, the hues of yellow and brown and wheat. My heart thundered, and I knew he could probably hear it. But he leaned his head toward me, a silent invitation, and I ran my fingers through his hair, gently, carefully. He purred, the sound rumbling through my fingers, arms, legs, and core. I wondered how that sound would feel if he were fully pressed up against me, skin to skin. I stepped back. 
He curled upward in a smooth, powerful motion and swiped with a single claw at the creeping vine I'd used for rope. I took a breath to shout, but he flipped as he fell, landing smoothly on his feet. It would be impossible for me to ever forget what he was, and what he was capable of. He took a step closer to me, the laughter still dancing on his face. Feeling better today? I mumbled some noncommittal response. Good, he said, either ignoring or hiding his amusement. But just in case, I wanted to give you this, he added, pulling some papers from his tunic and extending them to me. I bit the inside of my cheek as I stared down at the three pieces of paper. It was a series of five-lined poems. There were five of them altogether, and I began sweating at words I didn't recognize. It would take me an entire day just to figure out what these words meant. Before you bolt or start yelling, he said, coming around to peer over my shoulder. If I dared, I could have leaned back into his chest. His breath warmed my neck, the shell of my ear. He cleared his throat and read the first poem. There once was a lady most beautiful. Spirited, if a little unusual. Her friends were few. But how the men did cue. But to all she gave a refusal. My brows rose so high I thought they'd touch my hairline, and I turned, blinking at him, our breath mingling as he finished the poem with a smile. Without waiting for my response, Tamlin took the papers and stepped a pace away too. Read the second poem, which wasn't nearly as polite as the first. By the time he read the third poem, my face was burning. Tamlin paused before he read the fourth, then handed me back the papers. Final word in the second and fourth line of each poem, he said, jerking his chin toward the papers in my hands. Unusual. Q. I looked at the second poem. Slaying. Conflagration. These are, I started. Your list of words was too interesting to pass up. And not good for love poems at all. When I lifted my brow in silent inquiry, he said, we had contests to see who could write the dirtiest limericks while I was living with my father's warband by the border. I don't particularly enjoy losing, so I took it upon myself to become good at them. I didn't know how he'd remembered that long list I'd compiled, I didn't want to. Sensing I wasn't about to draw an arrow and shoot him, Tamlin took the papers and read the fifth poem, the dirtiest and foulest of them all. When he finished, I tipped back my head and held, my laughter like sunshine shattering age-hardened ice. I was still smiling when we walked out of the park and toward the rolling hills, meandering back to the manor. You said, that night in the rose garden, I sucked on my teeth for a moment. You said that your father had it planted for your parents upon their mating, not wedding? Hi Faye, mostly Mary, he said, his golden skin flushing a bit. But if they're blessed, they'll find their mate, their equal, their match in every way. Haifei wed without the mating bond, but if you find your mate, the bond is so deep that marriage is insignificant in comparison. I didn't have the nerve to ask if fairies had ever had mating bonds with humans, but instead dared to say, where are your parents? What happened to them? A muscle feathered in his jaw, and I regretted the question, if only for the pain that flickered in his eyes. My father, his claws gleamed at his knuckles, but didn't go out any farther. I definitely asked the wrong question. My father was as bad as Lucian's. Worse. My two older brothers were just like him, they kept slaves, all of them. And my brothers. I was young when the treaty was forged, but I still remember what my brothers used to, he trailed off. It left a mark, enough of a mark that when I saw you, your house, I couldn't, wouldn't let myself be like them. Wouldn't bring harm to your family, or you, or subject you to fairy whims. Slaves, there had been slaves here. I didn't want to know, had never looked for traces of them, even five hundred years later. I was still little better than chattel to most of his people, his world. That was why, why he'd offered the loophole, why he'd offered me the freedom to live wherever I wished in Prithian. Thank you, I said. He shrugged, as if that would dismiss his kindness, the weight of the guilt that still bore down on him. What about your mother? Tamlin loosed a breath. My mother, she loved my father deeply. Too deeply, but they were mated, and 
even if she saw what a tyrant he was, she wouldn't say an ill word against him. I never expected, never wanted, my father's title. My brothers would have never let me live to adolescence if they had suspected that I did. So the moment I was old enough, I joined my father's warband and trained so that I might someday serve my father, or whichever of my brothers inherited his title. He flexed his hands, as if imagining the claws beneath. I'd realized from an early age that fighting and killing were about the only things I was good at. I doubt that, I said. He gave me a wry smile. Oh, I can play a mean fiddle, but High Lord's sons don't become traveling minstrels. So I trained and fought for my father against whomever he told me to fight, and I would have been happy to leave the scheming to my brothers, but my power kept growing, and I couldn't hide it, not among our kind. He shook his head. Fortunately or unfortunately, they were all killed by the High Lord of an enemy court. I was spared, for whatever reason, or cauldron granted luck. My mother, I mourned. The others, a too tight shrug. My brothers would not have tried to save me from a fate like yours. I looked up at him. Such a brutal, harsh world, with families killing each other for power, for revenge, for spite and control. Perhaps his generosity, his kindness, was a reaction to that, perhaps he'd seen me and found it to be like gazing into a mirror of sorts. I'm sorry about your mother, I said, and it was all I could offer, all he'd once been able to offer me. He gave me a small smile. So that's how you became High Lord. Most High Lords are trained from birth in manners and laws and court warfare. When the title fell to me, it was a rough transition. Many of my father's courtiers defected to other courts rather than have a warrior beast snarling at them. A half-wild beast, Nesta had once called me. It was an effort to not take his hand, to not reach out to him and tell him that I understood. But I just said, then they're idiots. You've kept these lands protected from the blight, when it seems that others haven't fared so well. They're idiots, I said again. But darkness flickered in Tamlin's eyes, and his shoulders seemed to curve inward ever so slightly. Before I could ask about it, we cleared the little wood, a spread of hills and knolls laid out ahead. In the distance, there were massed fairies atop many of them, building what seemed to be unlit fires. What are those? I asked, halting. They're setting up bonfires, for Kalanmai. It's in two days. For what? Fire night? I shook my head. We don't celebrate holidays in the human realm. Not after you, your people left. In some places, it's forbidden. We don't even remember the names of your gods. What does Kala, Fire Knight celebrate? He rubbed his neck. It's just a spring ceremony. We light bonfires, and, the magic that we create helps regenerate the land for the year ahead. How do you create the magic? There's a ritual. But it's, very fairy. He clenched his jaw and continued walking, away from the unlit fires. You might see more fairies around than usual, fairies from this court, and from other territories, who are free to wander across the borders that night. I thought the blight had scared many of them away. It has, but there will be a number of them. Just, stay away from them all. You'll be safe in the house, but if you run into one, before we light the fires at sundown in two days, ignore them. And I'm not invited to your ceremony? No, you're not. He clenched and loosened his fingers, again and again, as if trying to keep the claws, contained. Though I tried to ignore it, my chest caved a bit. We walked back in the sort of tense silence we hadn't endured in weeks. Tamlin went rigid the moment we entered the gardens. Not from me or our awkward conversation, it was quiet with that horrible stillness that usually meant one of the nastier fairies was around. Tamlin bared his teeth in a low snarl. Stay hidden and no matter what you overhear, don't come out. Then he was gone. Alone, I looked to either side of the gravel path, like some gawking idiot. If there was indeed something here, I'd be caught in the open. Perhaps it was shameful not to go to his aid, but, he was a high lord. I would just get in the way. I had just ducked behind a hedge when I heard Tamlin and Lucian approaching. 
I silently swore and froze. Maybe I could sneak across the fields to the stables. If there was something amiss, the stables not only had shelter but also a horse for me to flee on. I was about to make for the high grasses mere steps beyond the edge of the gardens when Tamlin's snarl rippled through the air on the other side of the hedge. I turned, just enough to spy them through the dense leaves. Stay hidden, he'd said. If I, moved now, I would surely be noticed. I know what day it is, Tamlin said, but not to Lucian. Rather, the two of them faced. Nothing. Someone who wasn't there. Someone invisible. I would have thought they were playing a prank on me, had I not heard a low, disembodied voice reply. Your continued behavior is garnering a lot of interest at court, the voice said, deep and sibilant. I shivered, despite the warmth of the day. She has begun wondering, wondering why you haven't given up yet. And why Fornago wound up dead not too long ago. Tamlin's not like the other fools, Lucian snapped, his shoulders pushed back to raise himself to his full height, more warrior-like than I'd yet seen him. No wonder he had all those weapons in his room. If she expected bowed heads, then she's more of an idiot than I thought. The voice hissed, and my blood went cold at the noise. Speak you so ill of she who holds your fate in her hands? With one word, she could destroy this pathetic estate. She wasn't pleased when she heard of you dispatching your warriors. The voice now seemed turned toward Tamlin. But, as nothing has come of it, she has chosen to ignore it. There was a deep-throated growl from the High Lord, but his words were calm as he said, Tell her I'm getting sick of cleaning up the trash she dumps on my borders. The voice chuckled, the sound like sand shifting. She sets them loose as gifts, and reminders of what will happen if she catches you trying to break the terms of. He's not, Lucian snarled. Now, get out. We have enough of your ilk swarming on the borders, we don't need you defiling our home, too. For that matter, stay the hell out of the cave. It's not some common road for filth, like you to travel through, as they please. Tamlin loosed a growl of agreement. The invisible thing laughed again, such a horrible, vicious sound. Though you have a heart of stone, Tamlin, it said, and Tamlin went rigid, you certainly keep a host of fear inside it. The voice sank into a croon. Don't worry, high lord. It spat the title like a joke. All will be right as rain soon enough. Burn in hell, Lucian replied for Tamlin, and the thing laughed again before a flap of leathery wings boomed, a foul wind bit my face, and everything went silent. They breathed deeply after another moment. I closed my eyes, needing a steadying breath as well, but massive hands clamped onto my shoulders, and I yelped. It's gone, Tamlin said, releasing me. It was all I could do not to sag against the hedges. What did you hear? Lucian demanded, coming around the corner and crossing his arms. I shifted my gaze to Tamlin's face, but found it to be so white with anger, anger at that thing, that I had to look again at Lucian. Nothing, I, well, nothing I understood, I said, and meant it. None of it made any sense. I couldn't stop shaking. Something about that voice had ripped away the warmth from me. Who, what was that? Tamlin began pacing, the gravel churning beneath his boots. There are certain fairies in Prithian who inspired the legends that you humans are so afraid of. Some, like that one, are myth-given flesh. Inside that hissing voice I'd heard the screaming of human victims, the pleading of young maidens whose chests had been split open on sacrificial altars. Mentions of court, seemingly different from Tamlin's own, was that she the one who had killed Tamlin's parents? A high lady, perhaps, in lieu of a lord. Considering how ruthless the high fae were to their families, they had to be nightmarish to their enemies. And if there was to be warring between the courts, if the blight had left Tamlin already weakened. If the adder saw her, Lucian said, glancing around. It didn't, Tamlin said. Are you certain it? It didn't, Tamlin growled over his shoulder, then looked at me, his face still pale with fury, lips tight. I'll see you at dinner. Understanding a dismissal, and craving the locked door of my bedroom, I trudged back to the house, contemplating who this she was to make Tamlin and Lucian so nervous and to command that thing as her messenger. The spring breeze whispered that I didn't want to know. Chapter 20 
After a tense dinner, during which Tamlin hardly spoke to Lucian or me, I lit all the candles in my room to chase away the shadows. I didn't go outside the following day, and when I sat down to paint, what emerged on my canvas was a tall, skeletally thin gray creature with bat ears and giant, membranous wings. Its snout was open in a roar, revealing row after row of fangs as it leaped into flight. As I painted it, I could have sworn that I could smell breath that reeked of carrion, that the air beneath its wings whispered promises of death. The finished product was chilling enough that I had to set aside the painting in the back of the room and go try to persuade Alice to let me help with the fire night food preparations in the kitchen. Anything to avoid going into the garden, where the adder might appear. The day of fire night, Calamai, Tamlin had called it, dawned, and I didn't see Tamlin or Lucian all day. As the afternoon shifted into dusk, I found myself again at the main crossroads of the house. None of the bird-faced servants were to be found. The kitchen was empty of staff and the food they'd been preparing for two days. The sound of drums issued. The drum beats came from far away, beyond the garden, past the game park, into the forest that lay beyond. They were deep, probing. A single beat, echoed by two responding calls. Summoning. I stood by the doors to the garden, staring out over the property as the sky became a wash in hues of orange and red. In the distance, upon the sloping hills that led into the woods, a few fires flickered, plumes of dark smoke marring the ruby sky, the unlit bonfires I'd spotted two days ago. Not invited, I reminded myself. Not invited to whatever party had all the kitchen fairies tittering and laughing among one another. The drums turned faster, louder. Though I'd grown accustomed to the smell of magic, my nose pricked with the rising tang of metal, stronger than I'd yet sensed it. I took a step forward, then halted on the threshold. I should go back in. Behind me, the setting sun stained the black and white tiles of the hall floor a shimmering shade of tangerine, and my long shadow seemed to pulse to the beat of the drums. Even the garden, usually buzzing with the orchestra of its denizens, had quieted to hear the drums. There was a string, a string tied to my gut that pulled me toward those hills, commanding me to go, to hear the fairy drums. I might have done, just that, had Tamlin not appeared from down the hall. He was shirtless, with only the baldric across his muscled chest. The pommel of his sword glinted golden in the dying sunlight, and the feathered tops of arrows were stained. Red as they poked above his broad shoulder, I stared at him, and he watched me back. The warrior incarnate. Where are you going? I managed to get out. It's Calamai, he said flatly. I have to go. He jerked his chin to the fires and drums. To do what? I asked, glancing at the bow in his hand. My heart echoed the drums. Outside, building into a wilder beat. His green eyes were shadowed beneath the gilded mask. As a high lord, I have to partake in the great rite. What's the great? Go to your chamber, he snarled, and glanced toward the fires. Lock your doors, set up a snare, whatever you do, why? I demanded. The adder's voice snaked through my memory. Tamlin had said something about a very fairy ritual, what the hell was it? From the weapons, it had to be brutal and violent, especially if Tamlin's beast form wasn't weapon enough. Just do it. His canines began to lengthen. My heart leaped into a gallop. Don't come out until morning. Stronger, faster, the drums beat, and the muscles in Tamlin's neck quivered, as if standing still were somehow painful to him. Are you going into battle? I whispered, and he let out a breathy laugh. He lifted a hand as if to touch my arm. But he lowered it before his fingers could graze the fabric of my tunic. Stay in your chamber, fair. But I... Please. Before I could ask him to reconsider bringing me along, he took off running. The muscles in his back shifted as he leaped down the short flight of stairs and bounded into the garden, as spry and swift as a stag. Within seconds, he was gone. I did as he commanded, though I soon realized that I'd locked myself in my room without having eaten dinner and with the incessant drumming and dozens of bonfires that popped up along the far hills, I couldn't stop pacing up and down my room, gazing out toward the fires burning in the distance. Stay in your chamber. 
but a wild, wicked voice weaving in between the drumbeats whispered otherwise. Go, that voice said, tugging at me. Go see. By ten o'clock, I could no longer stand it. I followed the drums. The stables were empty, but Tamlin had taught me how to ride bareback these past few weeks, and my white mare was soon trotting along. I didn't need to guide her, she, too, followed the lure of the drums, and ascended the first of the foothills. Smoke and magic hung, thick in the air. Concealed in my hooded cloak, I gaped as I approached the first giant bonfire atop the hill. There were hundreds of high fae milling about, but I couldn't discern any of their features beyond the various masks they wore. Where had they come from, where did they live, if they belonged to the spring court, but did not dwell in the manor? When I tried to focus on a specific feature of their faces, it became a blur of color. They were more solid when I viewed them from the side of my vision, but if I turned to face them, I was met with shadows and swirling colors. It was magic, some kind of glamour put on me, meant to prevent my viewing them properly, just as my family had been glamoured. I would have been furious, would have considered going back to the manor had the drums not echoed through my bones and that wild voice not beckoned to me. I dismounted my mare, but kept close to her as I made my way through the crowd, my telltale human features hidden in the shadows of my hood. I prayed that the smoke and countless scents of various high fae and fairies were enough to cover my human smell but I checked to ensure that my two knives were still at my sides anyway as I moved deeper into the celebration. Though a cluster of drummers played on one side of the fire, the fairies flocked to a trench between two nearby hills. I left my horse tied to a solitary sycamore crowning a knoll and followed them, savoring the pulsing beat of the drums as it resonated through the earth and into the soles of my feet. No one looked twice in my direction. I almost slid down the steep bank as I entered the hollow. At one end, a cave mouth opened into a soft hillside. Its exterior had been adorned with flowers and branches and leaves, and I could make out the beginnings of a pelt-covered floor just past the cave mouth. What lay inside was hidden from view as the chamber veered away from the entrance, but firelight danced upon the walls. Whatever was occurring inside the cave, or whatever was about to happen, was the focus of the shadowy fairies as they lined either side of a long path leading to it. The path wended between the trenches among the hills, and the high face swayed in place, moving to the rhythm of the drumming, whose beats sounded in my stomach. I watched them sway, then shifted on my feet. I'd been banned from this? I scanned the fire-lit area, trying to peer through the veil of night and smoke. I found nothing of interest, and none of the masked fairies paid me any heed. They remained along the path, more and more of them coming each minute. Something was definitely going to happen, whatever this great rite was. I made my way back up the hillside and stood along the edge of a bonfire near the trees, watching the fairies. I was about to work up the courage to ask a lesser fairy who passed by, a bird-masked servant, like Alice, what sort of ritual was going to happen when someone grasped my arm and whirled me around. I blinked at the three strangers, dumbfounded as I beheld their sharp-featured faces, free of masks. They looked like high fae but there was something slightly different about them, something taller and leaner than Tamlin or Lucian, something crueler in their pitch-black, depthless eyes. Fairies, then. The one grasping my arm smiled down at me, revealing slightly pointed teeth. Human. Woman, he murmured, running an eye over me. We've not seen one of you for a while. I tried yanking my arm back, but he held my elbow firm. What do you want? I demanded, keeping my voice steady and cold. The two fairies who flanked him smiled at me, and one grabbed my other arm, just as I went for my knife. Just some fire night fun, one of them said, reaching out a pale, too long hand to brush back a lock of my hair. I twisted my head away and tried to step out of his touch, but he held firm. None of the fairies near the bonfire reacted, no one bothered to look. If I cried for help, would someone answer? Would Tamlin answer? I couldn't be that lucky again, I'd probably used up my allotted portion of luck with the Naga. I yanked my arms in earnest. Their grip tightened until it hurt, and they kept my hands well away from my knives. The three of them stepped closer, sealing me off from the others. I glanced around, looking for any ally. There were more non-masked fairies here now. The three fairies chuckled, a low hissing noise that ran along my body. 
I hadn't realized how far I stood from everyone else, how close I'd come to the forest's edge. Leave me alone, I said, louder and angrier than I'd expected, given the shaking that was starting in my knees. Bold statement from a human on Kalamai, said the one holding my left arm. The fires didn't reflect in his eyes. It was as if they gobbled up the light. I thought of the Naga, whose horrible exteriors matched their rotten hearts. Somehow, these beautiful, ethereal fairies were far worse. Once the rites performed, we'll have some fun, won't we? A treat, such a treat, to find a human woman here. I bared my teeth at him. Get your hands off me, I said, loud enough for anyone to hear. One of them ran a hand down my side, its bony fingers digging into my ribs, my hips. I jerked back, only to slam into the third one, who wove his long fingers through my hair and pressed close. No one looked, no one noticed. Stop it, I said, but the words came out in a strangled gasp as they began hurting me toward the line of trees, toward the darkness. I pushed and thrashed against them, they only hissed. One of them shoved me, and I staggered, falling out of their grasp. The ground welled up beneath me, and I reached for my knives, but sturdy hands grasped me under the shoulders, before I could draw them or hit the grass. They were strong hands, warm and broad. Not at all like the prodding, bony fingers of the three fairies, who went utterly still as whoever caught me gently set me upright. There you are. I've been looking for you, said a deep, sensual male voice I'd never heard. But I kept my eyes on the three fairies, bracing myself for flight as the male behind me stepped to my side and slipped a casual arm around my shoulders. The three lesser fairies paled, their dark eyes wide. Thank you for finding her for me, my savior said to them, smooth and polished. Enjoy the right. There was enough of a bite beneath his last words that the fairies stiffened. Without further comment, they scuttled back to the bonfires. I stepped out of the shelter of my savior's arm and turned to thank him. Standing before me was the most beautiful man I'd ever seen. Chapter 21 Everything about the stranger radiated sensual grace and ease. Hi Fay, no doubt. His short black hair gleamed like a raven's feathers, offsetting his pale skin and blue eyes so deep they were violet, even in the firelight. They twinkled with amusement as he beheld me. For a moment, we said nothing. Thank you didn't seem to cover what he'd done for me, but something about the way he stood with absolute stillness, the night seeming to press in closer around him, made me hesitate to speak, made me want to run in the other direction. He, too, wasn't wearing a mask, from another court, then. A half-smile played on his lips. What's a mortal woman doing here on fire night? His voice was a lover's purr that sent shivers through me caressing every muscle and bone and nerve. I took a step back. My friends brought me. The drumming was increasing in tempo, building to a climax I didn't understand. It had been so long since I'd seen a bare face that looked even vaguely human. His clothes, all black, all finely made, were cut close enough to his body that I could see how magnificent he was. As if he'd been molded from the night itself. And who are your friends? He was still smiling at me, a predator, sizing up prey. Two ladies, I lied again. Their names? He prowled closer, slipping his hands into his pockets. I retreated a little more and kept my mouth shut. Had I just traded three monsters for something far worse? When it became apparent I wouldn't answer, he chuckled. You're welcome, he said. For saving you. I bristled at his arrogance, but retreated another step. I was close enough to the bonfire, to that little hollow where the fairies were all gathered, that I could make it if I sprinted. Maybe someone would take pity on me, maybe Lucian or Alice were there. Strange for a mortal to be friends with two fairies, he mused, and began circling me. I could have sworn tendrils of starkest night trailed in his wake. Aren't humans usually terrified of us? And aren't you? for that matter, supposed to keep to your side of the wall? I was terrified of him, but I wasn't about to let him know. I've known them my whole life. I've never had anything to fear from them. He paused his circling. 
He now stood between me and the bonfire, and my escape route, and yet they brought you to the great right and abandoned you. They went to get refreshments, I said, and his smile grew. Whatever I had just said had given me away. I'd spotted the servants hauling off the food, but, maybe it wasn't here. He smiled for a heartbeat longer. I had never seen anyone so handsome, and never had so many warning bells peeled in my head because of it. I'm afraid the refreshments are a long way off, he said, coming closer now. It might be a while before they return, may I escort you somewhere in the meantime? He removed a hand from his pocket to offer his arm. He'd been able to scare off those fairies without lifting a finger. No, I said, my tongue thick and heavy. He waved his hand toward the hollow, toward the drums. Enjoy the right, then. Try to stay out of trouble. His eyes gleamed in a way that suggested staying out of trouble meant staying far, far away from him. Though it might have been the biggest risk I'd ever taken, I blurted, so you're not a part of the spring court. He returned to me, every movement exquisite and laced with lethal power, but I held my ground as he gave me a lazy smile. Do I look like I'm part of the spring court? The words were tinged with an arrogance that only an immortal could achieve. He laughed under his breath. No, I'm not a part of the noble spring court. And glad of it. He gestured to his face, where a mask might go. I should have walked away, should have shut my mouth. Why are you here, then? The man's remarkable eyes seemed to glow, with enough of a deadly edge that I backed up a step, because all the monsters have been let out of their cages tonight, no matter what court they belong to. So I may roam wherever I wish until the dawn. More riddles and questions to be answered. But I'd had enough, especially as his smile turned cold and cruel. Enjoy the right, I repeated as blandly as I could. I hurried back to the hollow, too aware of the fact that I was putting my back to him. I was grateful to lose myself in the crowd milling along the path to the cave, still waiting for some moment to occur. When I stopped shaking, I looked around at the gathered fairies. Most of them still wore masks, but there were some, like that lethal stranger and those three horrible fairies, who wore no masks at all, either fairies with no allegiance or members of other courts. I couldn't tell them apart. As I scanned the crowd, my eyes met with those of a masked fairy across the path. One was russet and shone as brightly as his red hair. The other was... metal. I blinked at the same moment he did, and then his eyes went wide. He vanished into nothing, and a second later, someone grabbed my elbow and yanked me out of the crowd. Have you lost your senses? Lucian shouted above the drums. His face was ghostly pale. What are you doing here? None of the fairies noticed us, they were all staring intensely down the path, away from the cave. I wanted to, I started, but Lucian cursed violently. Idiot, he yelled at me then glanced behind him toward where the other fairies stared. Useless human fool. Without further word, he slung me over his shoulder as if I were a sack of potatoes. Despite my wriggling and shouts of protest, despite my demands that he get my horse, he held firm, and when I looked up, I found that he was running, fast. Faster than anything should be able to move. It made me so nauseated that I shut my eyes. He didn't stop until the air was cooler and calmer, and the drumming was distant. Lucian dropped me on the floor of the manor hallway, and when I steadied myself, I found his face, just as pale as before. You stupid mortal, he snapped. Didn't he tell you to stay in your room? Lucian looked over his shoulder, toward the hills, where the drumming became so loud and fast that it was like a rainstorm. That was hardly anything. That wasn't even the ceremony. It was only then that I saw the sweat on his face and the panicked gleam in his eyes. By the cauldron, if Tam found you there. So what? I said, shouting as well. I hated feeling like a disobedient child. It's the great right, cauldron boil me. Didn't anyone tell you what it is? My silence was answer enough. I could almost see the drumbeats pulsing against his skin, beckoning him to rejoin the crowd. Fire Night signals the official start of spring, in Prithian, as well as in the mortal world, Lucian said. While his words were calm, they trembled slightly. 
I leaned against the wall of the hallway, forcing myself into a casualness I didn't feel. Here, our crops depend upon the magic we regenerate on Kalamai, tonight. I stuffed my hands into the pockets of my pants. Tamlin had said something similar two days ago. Lucian shuddered, as if shaking off an invisible touch. We do this by conducting the great rite. Each of the seven high lords of Prithian performs this every year, since their magic comes from the earth and returns to it at the end, it's a give and take. But what is it? I asked, and he clicked his tongue. Tonight, Tam will allow, great and terrible magic, to enter his body, Lucian said, staring at the distant fires. The magic will seize control of his mind, his body, his soul, and turn him into the hunter. It will fill him with his sole purpose, to find the maiden. From their coupling, magic will be released and spread to the earth, where it will regenerate life for the year to come. My face became hot, and I fought the urge to fidget. Tonight, Tam won't be the fairy you know, Lucian said. He won't even know his name. The magic will consume everything in him, but that one basic command, and need. Who, who's the maiden? I got out. Lucian snorted. No one knows until it's time. After Tam hunts down the white stag. And kills it for the sacrificial offering, he'll make his way to that sacred cave, where he'll find the path lined with fairy females waiting to be chosen as his mate for tonight. What? Lucian laughed. Yes, all those female fairies around you were females for Tamlin to pick. It's an honor to be chosen, but it's his instincts that select her. But you were there, and other male fairies. My face burned so hot that I began sweating. That was why those three horrible fairies had been there, and they'd thought that just by my presence, I was happy to comply with their plans. Ah. Lucian chuckled. Well, Tam's not the only one who gets to perform the rite tonight. Once he makes his choice, we're free to mingle. Though it's not the great rite, our own dalliances tonight will help the land, too. He shrugged off that invisible hand a second time, and his eyes fell upon the hills. You're lucky I found you when I did, though, he said. Because he would have smelled you, and claimed you, but it wouldn't have been Tamlin who brought you into that cave. His eyes met mine, and a chill went over me. And I don't think you would have liked it. Tonight is not for lovemaking. I swallowed my nausea. I should go, Lucian said, gazing at the hills. I need to return before he arrives at the cave, at least to try to control him when he smells you and can't find you in the crowd. It made me sick, the thought of Tamlin forcing me, that magic could strip away any sense of self, of right or wrong. But hearing that, that some feral part of him wanted me. My breath was painful. Stay in your room tonight, fair, Lucian said, walking to the garden doors. No matter who comes knocking, keep the door locked. Don't come out until morning. At some point, I dozed off while sitting at my vanity. I awoke the moment the drum stopped. A shuddering silence went through the house, and the hair on my arms arose as magic swept past me, rippling outward. Though I tried not to, I thought about the probable source and blushed, even as my chest tightened. I glanced at the clock. It was past two in the morning. Well, he'd certainly taken his time with the ritual, which meant the girl was probably beautiful and charming, and appealed to his instincts. I wondered whether she was glad to be chosen. Probably. She'd come to the hill of her own free will. And after all, Tamlin was a high lord, and it was a great honor. And I suppose Tamlin was handsome. Terribly handsome. Even though I couldn't see the upper part of his face, his eyes were fine and his mouth, beautifully curved and full. And then there was his body, which was, was. I hissed and stood. I stared at my door, at the snare I'd rigged. How utterly absurd, as if bits of rope and wood could protect me from the demons in this land. Needing to do something with my hands, I carefully disassembled the snare. Then I unlocked the door and strode into the hallway. What a ridiculous holiday. Absurd. It was. Good that humans had cast them aside. I made it to the empty kitchen, gobbled down half a loaf of bread, an apple, 
and a lemon tart, I nibbled on a chocolate cookie as I walked to my little painting room. I needed to get some of the furious images out of my mind, even if I had to paint by candlelight. I was about to turn down the hallway when a tall male figure appeared before me. The moonlight from the open window turned his mask silver, and his golden hair, unbound and crowned with laurel leaves, gleamed. Going somewhere? Tamlin asked. His voice was not entirely of this world. I suppressed a shudder. Midnight snack, I said, and I was keenly aware of every movement, every breath I took as I neared him. His bare chest was painted with whirls of dark blue woad, and from the smudges in the paint, I knew exactly where he'd been touched. I tried not to notice that they descended past his muscled midriff. I was about to pass him when he grabbed me, so fast that I didn't see anything until he had me pinned against the wall. The cookie dropped from my hand as he grasped my wrists. I smelled you, he breathed, his painted chest rising and falling so close to mine. I searched for you, and you weren't there. He reeked of magic. When I looked into his eyes, remnants of power flickered there. No kindness, none of the wry humor and gentle reprimands. The Tamlin I knew was gone. Let go, I said as evenly as I could, but his claws punched out, embedding in the wood above my hands. Still riding the magic, he was half wild. You drove me mad, he growled, and the sound trembled down my neck, along my breasts, until they ached. I searched for you, and you weren't there. When I didn't find you, he said, bringing his face closer to mine, until we shared breath, it made me pick another. I couldn't escape. I wasn't entirely sure that I wanted to. She asked me not to be gentle with her, either, he snarled, his teeth bright in the moonlight. He brought his lips to my ear. I would have been gentle with you, though. I shuddered as I closed my eyes. Every inch of my body went taut as his words echoed through me. I would have had you moaning my name throughout it all. And I would have taken a very, very long time, fair. He said my name like a caress, and his hot breath tickled my ear. My back arched slightly. He ripped his claws free from the wall, and my knees buckled as he let go. I grasped the wall, to keep from sinking to the floor, to keep from grabbing him, to strike or caress, I didn't know. I opened my eyes. He still smiled, smiled like an animal. Why should I want someone's leftovers? I said, making to push him away. He grabbed my hands again and bit my neck. I cried out as his teeth clamped onto the tender spot where my neck met my shoulder. I couldn't move, couldn't think, and my world narrowed to the feeling of his lips and teeth against my skin. He didn't pierce my flesh, but rather bit to keep me pinned, the push of. His body against mine, the hard and the soft, made me see red, see lightning, made me grind my hips against his. I should hate him, hate him for his stupid ritual, for the female he'd been with tonight. His bite lightened, and his tongue caressed the places his teeth had been. He didn't move, he just remained in that spot, kissing my neck. Intently, territorially, lazily. Heat pounded between my legs, and as he ground his body against me, against every aching spot, a moan slipped past my lips. He jerked away. The air was bitingly cold against my freed skin, and I panted as he stared at me. Don't ever disobey me again, he said, his voice a deep purr that ricocheted through me, awakening everything and lulling it into complicity. Then I reconsidered his words and straightened. He grinned at me in that wild way, and my hand connected with his face. Don't tell me what to do, I breathed, my palm stinging. And don't bite me like some enraged beast. He chuckled bitterly. The moonlight turned his eyes to the color of leaves and shadow. More, I wanted the hardness of his body crushing against mine. I wanted his mouth and teeth and tongue on my bare skin, on my breasts, between my legs. Everywhere, I wanted him everywhere. I was drowning in that need. His nostrils flared as he scented me, scented every burning, raging thought that was pounding through my body, my senses. The breath rushed from him in a mighty whoosh. He growled once, low and frustrated and vicious, before prowling away. Chapter 22 I awoke when the sun was high, after tossing and turning all night, empty and aching. 
The servants were sleeping in after their night of celebrating, so I made myself a bath and took a good, long soak. Try as I might to forget the feel of Tamlin's lips on my neck, I had an enormous bruise where he'd bitten me. After bathing, I dressed and sat at the vanity to braid my hair. I opened the drawers of the vanity, searching for a scarf or something to cover the bruise peeking over the collar of my blue tunic, but then paused and glared at myself in the mirror. He'd acted like a brute and a savage, and if he'd come to his senses by this morning, then seeing what he'd done would be minimal punishment. Sniffing, I opened the collar of my tunic farther and tucked stray strands of my golden brown hair behind my ears so there would be no concealing it. I was beyond cowering. Humming to myself and swinging my hands, I strode downstairs and followed my nose to the dining room, where I knew lunch was usually served for Tamlin and Lucian. When I flung open the doors, I found them both sprawled in their chairs. I could have sworn that Lucian was sleeping upright, fork in hand. Good afternoon, I said cheerfully, with an especially saccharine smile, for the High Lord. He blinked at me, and both of the fairy men murmured their greetings as I took a seat across from Lucian, not my usual place facing Tamlin. I drank deeply from my goblet of water before piling food on my plate. I savored the tense silence as I consumed the meal before me. You look, refreshed, Lucian observed with a glance at Tamlin. I shrugged. Sleep well, like a babe. I smiled at him and took another bite of food, and felt Lucian's eyes travel inexorably to my neck. What is that bruise? Lucian demanded. I pointed with my fork to Tamlin. Ask him. He did it. Lucian looked from Tamlin to me, and then back again. Why does Fair have a bruise on her neck from you? He asked, with no small amount of amusement. I bit her. Tamlin said, not pausing as he cut his steak. We ran into each other in the hall after the rite. I straightened in my chair. She seems to have a death wish, he went on, cutting his meat. The claws stayed. Retracted but pushed against the skin above his knuckles. My throat closed up. Oh, he was mad, furious at my foolishness for leaving my room, but somehow managed to keep his anger on a tight, tight leash. So, if Fair can't be bothered to listen to orders, then I can't be held accountable for the consequences. Accountable? I sputtered, placing my hands flat on the table. You cornered me in the hall, like a wolf, with a rabbit. Lucian propped an arm on the table and covered his mouth with his hand, his russet eye bright. While I might not have been myself, Lucian and I both told you to stay in your room, Tamlin said, so calmly that I wanted to rip out my hair. I couldn't help it. Didn't even try to fight the red-hot temper that raised my senses. Fairy pig. I yelled, and Lucian held, almost tipping back in his chair. At the sight of Tamlin's growing smile, I left. It took me a couple of hours to stop painting little portraits of Tamlin and Lucian with pig's features. But as I finished the last one, two fairy pigs wallowing in their own filth, I would call it, I smiled into the clear, bright light of my private painting room. The Tamlin I knew had returned. And it made me, happy. We apologized at dinner. He even brought me a bouquet of white roses from his parents' garden, and while I dismissed them as nothing, I made certain that Alice took good care of them when I returned to my room. She gave me only a wry nod before promising to set them in my painting room. I fell asleep with a smile still on my lips. For the first time in a long, long while, I slept peacefully. Don't know if I should be pleased or worried, Alice said the next night as she slid the golden underdress over my upraised arms, then tugged it down. I smiled a bit, marveling at the intricate metallic lace that clung to my arms and torso like a second skin, before falling loosely to the rug. It's just a dress, I said, lifting my arms again as she brought over the gossamer turquoise over gown. It was sheer enough to see the gleaming gold mesh beneath, and light and airy and full of movement as if it flowed on an invisible current. Alice just chuckled to herself and guided me over to the vanity to work on my hair. I didn't have the courage to look at the mirror as she fussed over me. Does this mean you'll be wearing gowns from now on? She asked, separating sections of my hair for whatever wonders she was doing to it. No, I said quickly. I mean, I'll be wearing my usual clothes during the day, but I thought it might be nice to try it out, at least for tonight. I see. 
Good that you aren't losing your common sense entirely, then. I twisted my mouth to the side. Who taught you how to do hair like this? Her fingers stilled, then continued their work. My mother taught me and my sister, and her mother taught her before that. Have you always been at the spring court? No, she said, pinning my hair in various, subtle places. No, we were originally from the summer court, that's where my kin still dwells. How'd you wind up here? Alice met my eyes in the mirror, her lips a tight line. I made a choice to come here. And my kin thought me mad. But my sister and her maid had been killed, and for her boys, she coughed, as if choking on the words. I came here to do what I could. She patted my shoulder. Have a look. I dared a glimpse at my reflection. I hurried from the room, before I could lose my nerve. I had to keep my hands clenched at my sides to avoid wiping my sweaty palms on the skirts of my gown as I reached the dining room, and immediately contemplated bolting upstairs and changing into a tunic and pants. But I knew they'd already heard me, or smelled me, or used whatever heightened senses they had to detect my presence, and since fleeing would only make it worse, I found it in myself to push open the double doors. Whatever discussion Tamlin and Lucian had been having stopped, and I tried not to look at their wide eyes as I strode to my usual place at the end of the table. Well, I'm late for something incredibly important, Lucian said, and before I could call him on his outright lie or beg him to stay, the fox-masked fairy vanished. I could feel the full weight of Tamlin's undivided attention on me, on every breath and movement I took. I studied the candelabras atop the mantel, beside the table. I had nothing to say that didn't sound absurd, yet for some reason, my mouth decided to start moving. You're so far away. I gestured to the expanse of table between us. It's like you're in another room. The quarters of the table vanished, leaving Tamlin not two feet away, sitting at an infinitely more intimate table. I yelped and almost tipped over in my chair. He laughed as I gaped at the small table that now stood between us. Better? he asked. I ignored the metallic tang of magic as I said, How, how did you do that? Where did it go? He cocked his head, between. Think of it as, a broom closet tucked between pockets of the world. He flexed his hands and rolled his neck, as if shaking off some pain. Does it tax you? Sweat seemed to gleam on the strong column of his neck. He stopped flexing his hands, and set them flat on the table. Once, it was as easy as, breathing. But now, it requires concentration. Because of the blight on Prithian and the toll it had taken on him. You could have just taken a closer seat, I said. Tamlin gave me a lazy grin. And miss a chance to show off to a beautiful woman? Never. I smiled down at my plate. You do look beautiful, he said quietly. I mean it, he added when my mouth twisted to the side. Didn't you look in the mirror? Though his bruise still marred my neck, I had looked pretty. Feminine. I wouldn't go so far as to call myself a beauty, but. I hadn't cringed. A few months here had done wonders for the awkward sharpness and angles of my face. And I dared say that some kind of light had crept into my eyes, my eyes, not my mother's eyes or Nesta's eyes. Mine. Thank you, I said and was grateful to avoid saying anything else as he served me, and then himself. When my stomach was full to bursting, I dared to look at him, really look at him, again. Tamlin leaned back in his chair, yet his shoulders were tight, his mouth a thin line. He hadn't been called to the border in a few days, hadn't come back weary and covered in blood since before fire night. And yet. He'd grieved for that nameless summer court fairy with the hacked-off wings. What grief and burdens did he bear for whoever else had been lost in this conflict, lost to the blight, or to the attacks on the borders? High Lord, a position he hadn't wanted or expected, yet he'd been forced to bear its weight as best he could. Come, I said, rising from my chair and tugging on his hand. The calluses scraped against mine, but his fingers tightened as he looked up at me. I have something for you. For me, he repeated, carefully, but rose. I led him out of the dining room. When I went to drop his hand, he didn't let go. It was enough to keep me walking quickly, 
as if I could outrun my thundering heart or the sheer immortal presence of him at my side. I brought him down hall after hall until we got to my little painting room, and he finally released my hand as I reached for the key. Cold air bit into my skin without the warmth of his hand around mine. I knew you'd asked Alice for a key, but I didn't think you actually locked the room, he said behind me. I gave him a narrowed glance over my shoulder as I pushed open the door. Everyone snoops in this house. I didn't want you or Lucian coming in here until I was ready. I stepped into the darkened room and cleared my throat, a silent request for him to light the candles. It took him longer than I'd seen him need before, and I wondered if shortening the table had somehow drained him more than he'd let on. The surreal had said the high lords were power, and yet, yet something had to be truly, thoroughly wrong if this was all he could manage. The room gradually flared with light, and I pushed my worry aside as I stepped farther into the room. I took a deep breath and gestured to the easel and the painting I'd put there. I hoped he wouldn't notice the paintings I'd leaned against the walls. He turned in place, staring around him at the room. I know they're strange, I said, my hands sweating again. I tucked them behind my back, and I know they're not, like, not as good as the ones you have here, but, I walked to the painting on the easel. It was an impression, not a lifelike rendering. I wanted you to see this one, I said, pointing to the smear of green and gold and silver and blue. It's for you. A gift. For everything you've done. Heat flared in my cheeks, my neck, my ears, as he silently approached the painting. It's the glen, with the pool of starlight, I said quickly. I know what it is, he murmured, studying the painting. I backed away a step, unable to bear watching him look at it. Wishing I hadn't brought him in here, blaming it on the wine I'd had at dinner, on the stupid dress. He examined the painting for a miserable eternity, then looked away, to the nearest painting leaning against the wall. My gut tightened. A hazy landscape of snow and skeletal trees and nothing else. It looked like, like nothing, I supposed, to anyone but me. I opened my mouth to explain, wishing I'd turned the others away from view, but he spoke. That was your forest. Where you hunted. He came closer to the painting, gazing at the bleak, empty cold, the white and gray and brown and black. This was your life, he clarified. I was too mortified, too stunned, to reply. He walked to the next painting I'd left against the wall. Darkness and dense brown, flickers of ruby red and orange squeezing out between them. Your cottage at night. I tried to move, to tell him to stop looking at those ones and look at the others I'd laid out, but I couldn't, couldn't even breathe properly as he moved to the next painting. A tanned, sturdy male hand fisted in the hay, the pale pieces of it entwined among strands of brown coated with gold, my hair. My gut twisted. The man you used to see, in your village. He cocked his head again as he studied the picture, and a low growl slipped out. While you made love. He stepped back, looking at the row of pictures. This is the only one with any brightness. Was that, jealousy? It was the only escape I had. Truth. I wouldn't apologize for Isaac. Not when Tamlin had just been in the great right. I didn't hold that against him, but if he was going to be jealous of Isaac, Tamlin must have realized it, too, for he loosed a long, controlled breath, before moving to the next painting. Tall shadows of men, bright red dripping off their fists, off their wooden clubs, hovering and filling the edges of the painting as they towered over the curled figure on the floor, the blood leaking from him, the leg at a wrong angle. Tamlin swore. You were there when they wrecked your father's leg. Someone had to beg them to stop. Tamlin threw a too knowing glance in my direction and turned to look at the rest of the paintings. There they were, all the wounds I'd slowly been leeching these few months. I blinked. A few months. Did my family believe that I would be forever away with this so dash? Called dying aunt? At last, Tamlin looked at the painting of the glen and the starlight. He nodded in appreciation. But he pointed to the painting of the snow-veiled woods. That one. I want that one. It's cold and melancholy, I said, hiding my wince. 
It doesn't suit this place at all. He went up to it, and the smile he gave me was more beautiful than any enchanted meadow or pool of stars. I want it nonetheless, he said softly. I'd never yearned for anything more than to remove his mask and see the face beneath, to find out whether it matched how I'd dreamed he looked. Tell me there's some way to help you, I breathed. With the masks, with whatever threat has taken so much of your power. Tell me, just tell me what I can do to help you. A human wishes to help a fairy? Don't tease me, I said. Please, just, tell me. There's nothing I want you to do, nothing you can do, or anyone. It's my burden to bear. You don't have to. I do. What I have to face, what I endure, fair, you would not survive. So I'm to live here forever, in ignorance of the true scope of what's happening? If you don't want me to understand what's going on, would you rather, I swallowed hard. Rather I found someplace else to live? Where I'm not a distraction? Didn't Kalamai teach you anything? Only that magic makes you into a brute. He laughed, though not entirely with amusement. When I remained silent, he sighed. No, I don't want you to live somewhere else. I want you here, where I can look after you, where I can come home and know you're here, painting and safe. I couldn't look away from him. I thought about sending you away at first, he murmured. Part of me still thinks I should have found somewhere else for you to live. But maybe I was selfish. Even when you made it so clear that you were more interested in ignoring the treaty or finding a way out of it, I couldn't bring myself to let you go, to find some place in Prithian where you'd be comfortable enough to not attempt to flee. Why? He picked up the small painting of the frozen forest and examined it again. I've had many lovers, he admitted. Females of noble birth, warriors, princesses, rage hit me, low and deep in the gut at the thought of them, rage at their titles, their undoubtedly good looks, at their closeness to him. But they never understood. What it was like, what it is like, for me to care for my people, my lands. What scars are still there, what the bad days feel like. That wrathful jealousy faded away like morning, dew, as he smiled, at my painting. This reminds me of it. Of what? I breathed. He lowered the painting, looking right at me, right into me, that I'm not alone. I didn't lock my bedroom door that night. Chapter 23 The next afternoon I lay on my back in the grass, savoring the warmth of the sunshine filtering through the canopy of leaves, noting how I might incorporate it into my next painting. Lucian, claiming that he had miserable emissary business to attend to, had left Tamlin and me to our own devices, and the High Lord had taken me to yet another beautiful spot in his enchanted forest. But there were no enchantments here, no pools of starlight, no rainbow waterfalls. It was just a grassy glen watched over by a weeping willow, with a clear brook running through it. We lounged in comfortable silence, and I glanced at Tamlin, who dozed, beside me. His golden hair and mask glistened bright against the emerald carpet. The delicate arch of his pointed ears made me pause. He opened an eye and smiled lazily at me. That willow singing always puts me to sleep. The what of what? I said, propping myself on my elbows, to stare at the tree above us. Tamlin pointed toward the willow. The branches sighed as they moved in the breeze. It sings. I suppose it sings war camp limericks, too? He smiled and half sat up, twisting to look at me. You're human, he said, and I rolled my eyes. Your senses are still sealed off from everything. I made a face. Just another of my many shortcomings. But the word, shortcomings, had somehow stopped finding its mark. He plucked a strand of grass from my hair. Heat radiated from my face as his fingers grazed my cheek. I could make you able to see it, he said. His fingers lingered at the end of my braid, twirling the curl of hair around. See my world, hear it, smell it. My breathing became shallow as he sat up, taste it. His eyes flicked to the fading bruise on my neck. How? I asked, heat blooming as he crouched before me. Every gift comes with a price. I frowned, and he grinned. A kiss. Absolutely not. But my blood raced, and I had to clench my hands in the grass, to keep from touching him. 
Don't you think it puts me at a disadvantage to not be able to see all this? I'm one of the high fae, we don't give anything without gaining something from it. To my own surprise, I said, fine. He blinked, probably expecting me to have fought a little harder. I hid my smile and sat up so that I faced him, our knees touching as we knelt in the grass. I licked my lips, my heart fluttering so quickly it felt as if I had a hummingbird inside my chest. Close your eyes, he said, and I obeyed, my fingers grappling onto the grass. The birds chattered, and the willow branches sighed. The grass crunched as Tamlin rose up on his knees. I braced myself at the brush of his mouth on one of my eyelids, then on the other. He pulled away, and I was left breathless, the kisses still lingering on my skin. The singing of birds became an orchestra, a symphony of gossip and mirth. I'd never heard so many layers of music, never heard the variations and themes that wove between their arpeggios. And beyond the birdsong, there was an ethereal melody, a woman, melancholy, and weary, the willow. Gasping, I opened my eyes. The world had become richer, clearer. The brook was a near-invisible rainbow of water that flowed over stones as invitingly smooth as silk. The trees were clothed in a faint shimmer that radiated from their centers and danced along the edges of their leaves. There was no tangy metallic stench, no, the smell of magic had become like jasmine, like lilac, like roses. I would never be able to paint it, the richness, the feel. Maybe fractions of it, but not the whole thing. Magic, everything was magic and it broke my heart. I looked to Tamlin, and my heart cracked entirely. It was Tamlin, but not. Rather, it was the Tamlin I'd dreamed of. His skin gleamed with a golden sheen, and around his head glowed a circlet of sunshine. And his eyes. Not merely green and gold, but every hue and variation that could be imagined, as though every leaf in the forest had bled into one shade. This was a high lord of Prithian. Devastatingly handsome, captivating, powerful beyond belief. My breath caught in my throat as I touched the contours of his mask. The cool metal bit into my fingertips, and the emerald slipped against my calloused skin. I lifted my other hand and gently grasped either side of the mask. I pulled lightly. It wouldn't move. He began smiling as I pulled again, and I blinked, dropping my hands. Instantly, the golden, glowing Tamlin vanished, and the one I knew returned. I could still hear the singing of the willow and the birds, but... Why can't I see you anymore? Because I willed my glamour back into place. Glamour for what? To look normal. Or as normal as I can look with this damn thing, he added, gesturing to the mask. Being a high lord, even one with, limited powers, comes with physical markers, too. It's why I couldn't hide what I was becoming from my brothers, from anyone. It's still easier to blend in. But the mask truly can't come off, I mean. Are you sure there's no one who knows how to fix what the magic did that night? Even someone in another court? I don't know. Why the mask bothered me so greatly. I didn't need to see his entire face to know him. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I just, just want to know what you look like. I wondered when I'd grown so shallow. What do you think I look like? I tilted my head to the side. A strong, straight nose, I said, drawing from what I'd once tried to paint. High cheekbones, that bring out your eyes. Slightly, slightly arched brows, I finished, blushing. He was grinning so broadly that I could almost see all of his teeth, those fangs, nowhere in sight. I tried to think up an excuse for my forwardness but a yawn crept from me as a sudden weight pressed on my eyes. What about your part of the bargain? What? He leaned closer, his smile turning wicked. What about my kiss? I grabbed his fingers. Here, I said, and slammed my mouth against the back of his hand. There's your kiss. Tamlin roared with laughter, but the world blurred, lulling me to sleep. The willow beckoned me to lie down, and I obliged. From far off, I heard Tamlin curse. Fair? Sleep. I wanted sleep. And there was no better place to sleep than right here, listening to the willow and the birds and the brook. I curled on my side, using my arm for a pillow. 
I should bring you home, he murmured, but he didn't move to drag me to my feet. Instead, I felt a slight thud in the earth, and the spring rain and new grass scent of him cloyed in my nose as he lay beside me. I tingled with pleasure as he stroked my hair. This was such a lovely dream. I'd never slept so wonderfully before. So warm, nestled beside him, calm. Faintly, echoing into my world of slumber, he spoke again, his breath caressing my ear. You're exactly as I dreamed you'd be, too. Darkness swallowed everything. Chapter 24 It wasn't the dawn that awoke me, but rather a buzzing noise. I groaned as I sat up in bed and squinted at the squat woman with skin made from tree bark who fussed with my breakfast dishes. Where's Alice? I asked, rubbing the sleep from my eyes. Tamlin must have carried me up here, must have carried me the whole way home. What? She turned toward me. Her bird mask was familiar. But I would have remembered a fairy with skin like that. Would have painted it already. Is Alice unwell? I said, sliding from the bed. This was my room, wasn't it? A quick glance told me yes. Are you out of your right mind? The fairy said. I bit my lip. I am Alice, she clucked, and with a shake of her head, she strode into the bathing room to start my bath. It was impossible. The Alice I knew was fair and plump and looked like a high fae. I rubbed my eyes with my thumb and forefinger. A glamour, that's what Tamlin had said he wore. His fairy sight had stripped away the glamours I'd been seeing. But why bother to glamour everything? Because I'd been a cowering human, that's why. Because Tamlin knew I would have locked myself in this room and never come out if I'd seen them all for their true selves. Things only got worse when I made my way downstairs to find the High Lord. The hallways were bustling with masked fairies I'd never seen before. Some were tall and humanoid, high fae like Tamlin, others were, not. Fairies. I tried to avoid looking at those ones, as they seemed the most surprised to notice my attention. I was almost shaking by the time I reached the dining room. Lucian, mercifully, appeared like Lucian. I didn't ask whether that was because Tamlin had informed him to put up a better glamour, or because he didn't bother trying to be something he wasn't. Tamlin lounged in his usual chair, but straightened as I lingered in the doorway. What's wrong? There are, a lot of people, fairies, around. When did they arrive? I'd almost yelped when I looked out my bedroom window and spotted all the fairies in the garden. Many of them, all with insect masks, pruned the hedges and tended the flowers. Those fairies had been the strangest of all, with their iridescent, buzzing wings sprouting from their backs. And, of course, then there was the green and brown skin, and their unnaturally long limbs, and Tamlin bit his lip as if to keep from smiling. They'd been here all along. But, but I didn't hear anything. Of course you didn't, Lucian drawled, and twirled one of his daggers between his hands. We made sure you couldn't see or hear anyone but those who were necessary. I adjusted the lapels of my tunic. So you mean that? that when I ran after the puka that night. You had an audience, Lucian finished for me, I thought I'd been so stealthy. Meanwhile, I'd been tiptoeing past fairies, who had probably laughed their heads off at the blind human, following an illusion. Fighting against my rising mortification, I turned to Tamlin. His lips twitched and he clamped them tightly together, but the amusement still danced in his eyes as he nodded. It was a valiant effort. But I could see the naga, and the puka, and the surreal. And, and that fairy whose wings were, ripped off, I said, wincing inwardly. Why didn't the glamour apply to them? His eyes darkened. They're not members of my court, Tamlin said, so my glamour didn't keep a hold on them. The puka belongs to the wind and weather and everything that changes. And the naga, they belong to someone else. I see, I lied, not quite seeing at all. Lucian chuckled, sensing it, and I glared sidelong at him. You've been noticeably absent again. He used the dagger to clean his nails. I've been busy. So have you, I take it. What's that supposed to mean? I demanded. If I offer you the moon on a string, will you give me a kiss, too? Don't be an ass, 
Tamlin said to him with a soft snarl, but Lucian continued laughing, and was still laughing when he left the room. Alone with Tamlin, I shifted on my feet. So if I were to encounter the adder again, I said, mostly to avoid the heavy silence, would I actually see it? Yes, and it wouldn't be pleasant. You said it didn't see me that time, and it certainly doesn't seem like a member of your court, I ventured. Why? Because I threw a glamour over you when we entered the garden, he said simply. The adder couldn't see, hear, or smell you. His gaze went to the window beyond me, and he ran a hand through his hair. I've done all I can to keep you invisible to creatures like the adder, and worse. The blight is acting up again, and more of these creatures are being freed from their tethers. My stomach turned over. If you spot one, Tamlin continued, even if it looks harmless, but makes you feel uncomfortable, pretend you don't see it. Don't talk to it. If it hurts you, I, the results wouldn't be pleasant for it, or for me. You remember what happened with the Naga. This was for my own safety, not his amusement. He didn't want me hurt, he didn't. Want to punish them for hurting me. Even if the Naga hadn't been part of his court, had it hurt him to kill them? Realizing he waited for my answer, I nodded. The, the blight is growing again? So far, only in other territories. You're safe here. It's not my safety, I'm worried about. Tamlin's eyes softened, but his lips became a thin line as he said, it'll be fine. Is it possible that the surge will be temporary? A fool's hope. Tamlin didn't reply, which was answer enough, if the blight was becoming active again. I didn't bother to offer my aid. I already knew he wouldn't allow me to help with whatever this conflict was. But I thought of that painting I'd given him, and what he'd said about it, and wished he would let me in anyway. The next morning, I found a head in the garden. A bleeding male high fey head, spiked atop a fountain statue of a great heron flapping its wings. The stone was soaked in enough blood to suggest that the head had been fresh when someone had impaled it on the heron's upraised bill. I had been hauling my paints and easel out to the garden to paint one of the beds of irises when I stumbled across it. My tins and brushes had clattered to the gravel. I didn't know where I went as I stared at that still screaming head, the brown eyes bulging, the teeth broken and bloody. No mask, so he wasn't a part of the spring court. Anything else about him, I couldn't discern. His blood was so bright on the gray stone, his mouth opened so vulgarly. I backed away a step, and slammed into something warm and hard. I whirled, hands rising out of instinct, but Tamlin's voice said, It's me, and I stopped cold. Lucian stood beside him, pale and grim. Not Autumn Court, Lucian said. I don't recognize him at all. Tamlin's hands clamped on my shoulders as I turned back toward the head. Neither do I. A soft, vicious growl laced his words, but no claws pricked my skin as he kept gripping me. His hands tightened, though, while Lucian stepped into the small pool in which the statue stood, striding through the red water until he peered up at the anguished face. They branded him behind the ear with a sigil, Lucian said, swearing, a mountain with three stars. Night Court, Tamlin said too quietly. The night court, the northernmost bit of Prithian, if I recalled the mural's map, correctly. A land of darkness and starlight. Why, why would they do this? I breathed. Tamlin let go, coming to stand at my side as Lucian climbed the statue to remove the head. I looked toward a blossoming crabapple tree instead. The night court does what it wants, Tamlin said. They live by their own codes, their own corrupt morals. They're all sadistic killers, Lucian said. I dared a glance at him, he was now perched on the heron's stone wing. I looked away again. They delight in torture of every kind, and would find this sort of stunt to be amusing. Amusing, but not a message? I scanned the garden. Oh, it's a message, Lucian said, and I cringed at the thick, wet sounds of flesh and bone on stone as he yanked the head off. I'd skinned enough animals, but this, Tamlin put another hand on my shoulder. To get in and out of our defenses, to possibly commit the crime nearby, with the blood this fresh, a splash as Lucian landed in the water again, it's exactly what the High Lord of the Night Court would find amusing. 
the bastard. I gauge the distance between the pool and the house. 60, maybe 70 feet. That's how close they'd come to us. Tamlin brushed a thumb against my shoulder. You're still safe here. This was just their idea of a prank. This isn't connected to the blight? I asked. Only in that they know the blight is again awakening, and want us to know they're circling the spring court like vultures, should our wards fall further. I must have looked as sick as I felt, because Tamlin added, I won't let that happen. I didn't have the heart to say that their masks made it fairly clear that nothing could be done against the blight. Lucian splashed out of the fountain, but I couldn't look at him, not with the head he bore, the blood surely on his hands and clothes. They'll get what's coming to them soon enough. Hopefully the blight will wreck them, too. Tamlin growled at Lucian to take care of the head, and the gravel crunched as Lucian departed. I crouched to pick up my paints and brushes, my hands shaking as I fumbled for a large brush. Tamlin knelt next to me, but his hands closed around mine, squeezing. You're still safe, he said again. The surreal's command echoed through my mind. Stay with the High Lord, human. You will be safe. I nodded. It's court posturing, he said. The night court is deadly, but this was only their lord's idea of a joke. Attacking anyone here, attacking you, would cause more trouble than it's worth for him. If the blight truly does harm these lands, and the night court enters our borders, we'll be ready. My knee shook as I rose. Fairy politics, fairy courts. Their idea of jokes must have been even more horrible when we were enslaved to you all. They must have tortured us whenever they liked, must have done such unspeakable, awful things to their human pets. A shadow flickered in his eyes. Some days, I'm very glad I was still a child when my father sent his slaves south of the wall. What I witnessed then was bad enough. I didn't want to imagine. Even now, I still hadn't looked to see if any hints of those long-ago humans had been left behind. I did not think five centuries would be enough to cleanse the stain of the horrors that my people had endured. I should have let it go, should have, but couldn't. Do you remember if they were happy to leave? Tamlin shrugged. Yes. Yet they had never known freedom, or known the seasons as you do. They didn't know what to do in the mortal world. But yes, most of them were very, very happy to leave. Each word was more ground out than the next. I was happy to see them go, even if my father wasn't. Despite the stillness with which he stood, his claws poked out from above his knuckles. No wonder he'd been so awkward with me, had no idea what to do with me, when I'd first arrived. But I said quietly, you're not your father, Tamlin. Or your brothers. He glanced away, and I added, you never made me feel like a prisoner, never made me feel like little more than chattel. The shadows that flickered in his eyes, as he nodded, his thanks, told me there was more. Still more that he had yet to tell me about his family, his life before they'd been killed and this title had been thrust upon him. I wouldn't ask, not with the blight pressing down on him, not until he was ready. He'd given me space and respect, I could offer him no less. Still, I couldn't bring myself to paint that day. Chapter 25 Tamlin was called away to one of the border's hours after I found that head, where and why, he wouldn't tell me. But I sensed enough from what he didn't say, the blight was indeed crawling from other courts, directly toward ours. He stayed the night, the first he'd ever spent away, but sent Lucian to inform me that he was alive. Lucian had emphasized that last word enough that I slept terribly, even as a small part of me marveled that Tamlin had bothered to let me know about his well-being. I knew. I knew I was headed down a path that would likely end in my mortal heart being left in pieces, and yet. And yet I couldn't stop myself. I hadn't been able to since that day with the Naga. But seeing that head, the games these courts played, with people's lives as tokens on a board, it was an effort to keep food down whenever I thought about it. Yet despite the creeping malice, I awoke the next day to the sound of merry fiddling, and when I looked out the window I found the garden bedecked in ribbons and streamers. On the distant hills, I spied the makings of fires and maples being raised. 
When I asked Alice, whose people, I'd learned, were called the Eurisk, she simply said, summer solstice. The main celebration used to be at the summer court, but, things are different. So now we have one here, too. You're going. Summer, in the weeks that I'd been painting and dining with Tamlin and wandering the court lands at his side, summer had come. Did my family still truly believe me to be visiting some long-lost aunt? What were they doing with themselves? If it was the solstice, then there would be a small gathering in the village center, nothing religious, of course, though the children of the blessed might wander in to try to convert the young people, just some shared food, donated ale from the solitary tavern, and maybe some line dances. The only thing to celebrate was a day's break from the long summer days of planting and tilling. From the decorations around the estate, I could tell this would be something far grander, far more spirited. Tamlin remained gone for most of the day. Worry not at me even as I painted a quick, loose rendering of the streamers and ribbons in the garden. Perhaps it was petty and selfish, given the returning blight, but I also quietly hoped that the solstice didn't require the same rites as fire night. I didn't let myself think too much about what I would do if Tamlin had a flock of beautiful fairies lining up for him. It wasn't until late afternoon that I heard Tamlin's deep voice and Lucian's braying laugh echo through the halls all the way to my painting room. Relief sent my chest caving in, but as I rushed to find them, Alice yanked me upstairs. She stripped off my paint-splattered clothes and insisted I change into a flowing, cornflower-blue chiffon gown. She left my hair unbound but wove a garland of pink, white, and blue wildflowers around the crown of my head. I might have felt childish with it on, but in the months I'd been there, my sharp bones and skeletal form had filled out. A woman's body. I ran my hands over the sweeping, soft curves of my waist and hips. I had never thought I would feel anything but muscle and bone. Cauldron boil me, Lucian whistled as I came down the stairs. She looks positively, Fay. I was too busy looking Tamlin over, scanning for any injury, any sign of blood or mark that the blight might have left, to thank Lucian for the compliment. But Tamlin was clean, almost glowing, completely unarmed, and smiling at me. Whatever he'd gone to deal with had left him unscathed. You look lovely, Tamlin murmured, and something in his soft tone made me want to purr. I squared my shoulders, disinclined to let him see how much his words or voice or sheer well-being impacted me. Not yet. I'm surprised I'm even allowed to participate tonight. Unfortunately for you and your neck, Lucy encountered, tonight's just a party. Do you lie awake at night to come up with all your witty replies for the following day? Lucian winked at me, and Tamlin laughed and offered me his arm. He's right, the High Lord said. I was aware of every inch where we touched, of the hard muscles, beneath his green tunic. He led me into the garden, and Lucian followed. Solstice celebrates when day and night are equal, it's a time of neutrality, when everyone can take down their hair and simply enjoy being a fairy, not high fae or fairy, just us, and nothing else. So there's singing and dancing and excessive drinking, Lucian chimed in, falling into step beside me and dallying, he added with a wicked grin. Indeed, every brush of Tamlin's body against mine made it harder to avoid the urge to lean into him entirely, to smell him and touch him and taste him. Whether he noticed the heat singeing my neck and face, or heard my uneven heartbeat, he revealed nothing, holding my arm tighter as we walked out of the garden and into the fields beyond. The sun was beginning its final descent when we reached the plateau on which the festivities were to be held. I tried not to gawk at the fairies gathered, even as I was in turn gawked at by them. I'd never seen so many in one place before, at least not without the glamour hiding them from me. Now that my eyes were open to the sight, the exquisite dresses and lithe forms that were shaped and colored and built so strangely and differently were a marvel to behold. Yet what little novelty my own presence by the High Lord's side offered soon wore off, helped by a low. Warning growl from Tamlin that sent the others scattering to mind their own business. Table after table of food had been lined up along the far edge of the plateau, and I lost Tamlin while I waited in line to fill a plate, leaving me to try my best not to look like I was some human plaything of his. Music started near the giant, smoking bonfire, fiddles and drums and merry instruments that had me tapping my feet in the grass. 
light and joyous. And open, the mirthful sister to the bloodthirsty fire knight. Lucian, of course, excelled at disappearing when I needed him, and so I ate my fill of strawberry shortcake, apple tart, and blueberry pie, no different from summer treats in the mortal realm, alone beneath a sycamore covered with silken lanterns and sparkling ribbons. I didn't mind the solitude, not when I was busy contemplating the way the lanterns and ribbons shone, the shadows they cast, perhaps it would be my next painting. Or maybe I would paint the ethereal fairies beginning to dance. Such angles and colors to them. I wondered if any of them had been the subjects of the painters whose work was displayed in the gallery, I moved only to get myself something to drink. The plateau became more crowded as the sun sank toward the horizon. Across the hills, other bonfires and parties began, their music filtering through the occasional pause in ours. I was pouring myself a goblet of golden sparkling wine when Lucian finally appeared behind me, peering over my shoulder. I wouldn't drink that if I were you. Oh? I said, frowning at the fizzing liquid. Fairy wine at the solstice, Lucian hinted. Hmm, I said, taking a sniff. It didn't reek of alcohol. In fact, it smelled like summer spent lying in the grass and bathing in cool pools. I'd never smelled anything so fantastic. I'm serious, Lucian said as I lifted the glass to my lips, my brows raised. Remember the last time you ignored my warning? He poked me in the neck, and I batted his hand away. I also remember you telling me how witch berries were harmless, and the next thing I knew, I was half delirious and falling all over myself, I said recalling the afternoon from a few weeks ago. I'd had hallucinations for hours afterward, and Lucian had laughed himself sick enough so that Tamlin had chucked him into the reflection pool. I shook away the thought. Today, just for today, I would indeed let my hair down. Today, let caution be damned. Forget the blight hovering at the edges of the court, threatening my high lord and his lands. Where was Tamlin, anyway? If there had been some threat, surely Lucian would have known, surely they would have called off the celebration. Well, I mean it this time, Lucian said, and I shifted my goblet out of his reach. Tam would gut me if he caught you drinking that, always looking after your best interests, I said, and pointedly chugged the contents of the glass. It was like a million fireworks exploding inside me, filling my veins with starlight. I laughed aloud, and Lucian groaned. Human fool, he hissed. But his glamour had been ripped away. His auburn hair burned like hot metal, and his russet eye smoldered like a bottomless forge. That was what I would capture next. I'm going to paint you, I said, and giggled, actually giggled, as the words popped. Out. Cauldron boil and fry me, he muttered, and I laughed again. Before he could stop me, I downed another glass of fairy wine. It was the most glorious thing I'd ever tasted. It liberated me from bonds I hadn't known existed. The music became a siren song. The melody was my lodestone, and I was powerless against its lure. With each step, I savored the dampness of the grass beneath my bare feet. I didn't remember when I'd lost my shoes. The sky was an eddy of molten amethyst, sapphire, and ruby, all bleeding into a final pool of onyx. I wanted to swim in it, wanted to bathe in its colors, and feel the stars twinkling between my fingers. I stumbled, blinking, and found myself standing at the edge of the ring of dancing. A cluster of musicians played their fairy instruments, and I swayed on my feet as I watched the fairies dancing, circling the bonfire. Not formal dancing. It was like they were as loose as I was. Free. I loved them for it. Damn it, fair, Lucian said, gripping my elbow. Do you want me to kill myself trying to keep you from impaling your mortal hide on another rock? What? I said, turning to him. The whole world spun with me, delightful and entrancing. Idiot, he said when he looked at my face. Drunken idiot. The tempo increased. I wanted to be in the music wanted to ride its speed and weave, between its notes. I could feel the music around me, like a living, breathing thing of wonder and joy and beauty. Fair, stop, Lucian said, and grabbed me again. I'd been dancing away, 
and my body was still swaying toward the pull of the sound. You stop. Stop being so serious, I said, shaking him off. I wanted to hear the music, wanted to hear it hot off the instruments. Lucian swore as I burst into movement, I skipped between the dancers, twirling my skirts. The seated, masked musicians didn't look up at me as I leaped before them, dancing in place. No chains, no boundaries, just me and the music, dancing and dancing. I wasn't fairy, but I was a part of this earth, and the earth was a part of me, and I would be content to dance upon it for the rest of my life. One of the musicians looked up from his fiddling, and I halted. Sweat gleamed on the strong column of his neck as he rested his chin upon the dark wood of the fiddle. He'd rolled up the sleeves of his shirt, revealing the cords of muscle along his forearms. He had once mentioned that he would have liked to be a traveling minstrel if not a warrior or a high lord, now, hearing him play, I knew he could have made a fortune from it. I'm sorry, Tam, Lucian panted, appearing from nowhere. I left her alone for a little at one of the food tables, and when I caught up to her, she was drinking the wine, and Tamlin didn't pause in his playing. His golden hair damp with sweat, he looked marvelously handsome, even though I couldn't see most of his face. He gave me a feral, smile as I began to dance in place before him. I'll look after her, Tamlin murmured above the music, and I glowed, my dancing becoming faster. Go enjoy yourself. Lucian fled. I shouted over the music, I don't need a keeper. I wanted to spin and spin and spin. No, you don't, Tamlin said, never once stumbling over his playing. How his bow did. Dance upon the strings, his fingers sturdy and strong, no signs of those claws that I had. Come to stop fearing. Dance, fair, he whispered. So I did. I was loosened, a top whirling around and around, and I didn't know who I danced with or what they looked like, only that I had become the music and the fire and the night, and there was nothing that could slow me down. Through it all, Tamlin and his musicians played such joyous music that I didn't think the world could contain it all. I sashayed over to him, my fairy lord, my protector and warrior, my friend, and danced before him. He grinned at me, and I didn't break my dancing as he rose from his seat and knelt before me in the grass, offering up a solo on his fiddle to me. Music just for me, a gift. He played on, his fingers fast and hard upon the strings of his fiddle. My body slithering like a snake, I tipped my head back to the heavens and let Tamlin's music fill all of me. There was a pressure at my waist, and I was swept away in someone's arms as they whisked me back into the ring of dancing. I laughed so hard I thought I'd combust, and when I opened my eyes, I found Tamlin there, spinning me round and round. Everything became a blur of color and sound, and he was the only object in it, tethering me to sanity, to my body, which glowed and burned in every place he touched. I was filled with sunshine. It was like I'd never experienced summer before like I'd never known who was waiting to emerge from that forest of ice and snow. I didn't want it to end, I never wanted to leave this hilltop. The music came to a close, and, gasping for breath, I glanced at the moon, it was near setting. Sweat slid down every part of my body. Tamlin, panting as well, took my hand. Time goes faster when you're drunk on fairy wine. I'm not drunk, I said, snorting. He only chuckled and led me from the dancing. I dug my heels into the ground as we neared the edge of the firelight. They're starting again, I said, pointing to the dancers gathering before the refreshed musicians. He leaned close, his breath caressing the shell of my ear as he whispered, I want to show you something better. I stopped objecting. He led me off the hill, navigating his way by moonlight. Whatever path he chose, he did so out of consideration for my bare feet for only soft grass cushioned my steps. Soon, even the music faded away, replaced by the sighing of trees in the night breeze. Here, Tamlin said, pausing at the edge of a vast meadow. His hand lingered on my shoulder as we looked out. The high grasses moved like water as the last of the moonlight danced upon them. What is it? I breathed, but he put a finger to his lips and beckoned me to look. For a few minutes, there was nothing. Then, from the opposite side of the meadow, dozens of shimmering shapes floated out across the grass, little more than mirages of moonlight. 
that was when the singing began. It was a collective voice, but in it existed both male and female, two sides of the same coin, singing to each other in a call and response. I raised a hand to my throat as their music rose, and they danced. Ghostly and ethereal, they waltzed across the field, no more than slender slants of moonlight. What are they? Willow the wisps, spirits of air and light, he said softly. Come to celebrate the solstice. They're beautiful. His lips grazed my neck as he murmured against my skin, dance with me, fair. Really? I turned and found my face, mere inches from his. He cracked a lazy smile. Really? As though I were nothing but air myself, he pulled me into a sweeping dance. I barely remembered any of the steps I'd learned in childhood, but he compensated for it with his feral grace, never faltering, always sensing any stumble before I made it as we danced across the spirit-riddled field. I was as unburdened as a piece of dandelion fluff, and he was the wind that stirred me about the world. He smiled at me, and I found myself smiling back. I didn't need to pretend, didn't need to be anything but what I was right then, being twirled about the meadow, the will-o'-the-wisps dancing around us like dozens of moons. Our dancing slowed and we stood there, holding each other as we swayed to the songs of the spirits. He rested his chin upon my head and stroked my hair, his fingers grazing the bare skin of my neck. Fair, he whispered onto my head. He made my name sound beautiful. Fair, he whispered again, not in question, but simply as if he enjoyed saying it. As quickly as they'd appeared, the spirits vanished, taking their music with them. I blinked. The stars were fading, and the sky had turned grayish-purple. Tamlin's face was inches from my own. It's almost dawn. I nodded, mesmerized by the sight of him, the smell and feel of him holding me. I reached up to touch his mask. It was so cold, despite how flushed his skin was just beyond it. My hand shook, and my breathing became shallow as I grazed the skin of his jaw. It was smooth and hot. He wet his lips, his breathing as uneven as my own. His fingers contracted against the plane of my lower back, and I let him tug me closer to him, until our bodies were touching, and the warmth of him seeped into me. I had to tilt my head back, to see his face, his mouth was caught somewhere between a smile and a wince. What? I asked, and put a hand on his chest, preparing to shove myself back. But his other hand slipped under my hair, resting at the base of my neck. I'm thinking I might kiss you, he said quietly, intently. Then do it. I blushed at my own boldness. But Tamlin only gave that breathy laugh, and leaned in. His lips brushed mine, testing, soft and warm. He pulled back a little. He was still staring at me, and I stared right back as he kissed me again, harder, but nothing like the way he'd kissed my neck. He withdrew more fully this time and watched me. That's it? I demanded, and he laughed and kissed me fiercely. My hands went around his neck, pulling him closer, crushing myself against him. His hands roved my back, playing in my hair, grasping my waist, as if he couldn't touch enough of me at once. He let out a low groan. Come, he said, kissing my brow. We'll miss it if we don't go now. Better than Will o' the Wisps? I asked, but he kissed my cheeks, my neck, and finally my lips. I followed him into the trees, through the ever-lightning world. His hand was solid and unmovable around mine as we passed through the low-lying mists, and he helped me up a bare hill slick with dew. We sat atop its crest, and I hid my smile as Tamlin put an arm around my shoulders, tucking me in close. I rested my head against his chest while he toyed with the flowers in my garland. In silence, we stared out over the rolling green expanse. The sky shifted into periwinkle, and the clouds filled with pink light. Then, like a shimmering disk too rich and clear to be described, the sun slipped over the horizon and lined everything with gold. It was like seeing the world being born, and we were the sole witnesses. Tamlin's arm tightened around me, and he kissed the top of my head. I pulled back, looking up at him. The gold in his eyes, bright with the rising sun, flickered. What? My father once told me that I should let my sisters imagine a better life, a better world. 
and I told him that there was no such thing. I ran my thumb over his mouth, marveling, and shook my head. I never understood, because I couldn't, couldn't believe that it was even possible. I swallowed, lowering my hand. Until now. His throat bobbed. His kiss that time was deep and thorough, unhurried and intent. I let the dawn creep inside me, let it grow with each movement of his lips and brush of his tongue against mine. Tears pricked beneath my closed eyes. It was the happiest moment of my life. Chapter 26 The next day, Lucian joined us for lunch, which was breakfast for all of us. Ever since I'd complained about the unnecessary size of the table, we'd taken to dining at a much reduced version. Lucian kept rubbing at his temples as he ate, unusually silent, and I hid my smile as I asked him, and where were you last night? Lucian's medal I narrowed on me. I'll have you know that while you two were dancing with the spirits, I was stuck on border patrol. Tamlin gave a pointed cough, and Lucian added, with some company. He gave me a sly grin, rumor has it you two didn't come back until after dawn. I glanced at Tamlin, biting my lip. I'd practically floated into my bedroom that morning. But Tamlin's gaze now roved my face as if searching for any tinge of regret, of fear. Ridiculous. You bit my neck on fire night, I said under my breath. If I can face you after that, a few kisses are nothing. He braced his forearms on the table as he leaned closer to me. Nothing? His eyes flicked to my lips. Lucian shifted in his seat, muttering to the cauldron to spare him, but I ignored him. Nothing, I repeated a bit distantly, watching Tamlin's mouth move, so keenly aware of every movement he made, resenting the table between us. I could almost feel the warmth of his breath. Are you sure, he murmured, intent and hungry enough, that I was glad I was sitting. He could have had me right there, on top of that table. I wanted his broad hands running over my bare skin, wanted his teeth scraping against my neck, wanted his mouth all over me. I'm trying to eat, Lucian said, and I blinked, the air whooshing out of me. But now that I have your attention, Tamlin, he snapped, though the High Lord was looking at me again, devouring me with his eyes. I could hardly sit still, could hardly stand the clothes scratching my too hot skin. With some effort, Tamlin glanced back at his emissary. Lucian shifted in his seat. Not to be the bearer of truly bad tidings, but my contact at the Winter Court managed to get a letter to me. Lucian took a steadying breath, and I wondered, wondered if being emissary also meant being spymaster. And wondered why he was bothering to say this in my presence at all. The smile instantly faded from Tamlin's face. The blight, Lucian said tightly, softly. It took out two dozen of their younglings. Two dozen, all gone. He swallowed. It just, burned through their magic, then broke apart their minds. No one in the winter court could do anything, no one could stop it once it turned its attention toward them. Their grief is, unfathomable. My contact says. Other courts are being hit hard, though the night court, of course, manages to remain in scathe, but the blight seems to be sending its wickedness this way, farther south, with every attack. All the warmth, all the sparkling joy, drained from me like blood down a drain. The blight can, can truly kill people? I managed to say. Younglings. It had killed children, like some storm of darkness and death. And if offspring were as rare as Alice had claimed, the loss of so many would be more devastating than I could imagine. Tamlin's eyes were shadowed, and he slowly shook his head, as if trying to clear the grief and shock of those deaths from him. The blight is capable of hurting us and ways you. He shot to his feet, so quickly, that his chair flipped over. He unsheathed his claws, and snarled, at the open doorway, canines, long and gleaming. The house, usually full of the whispering skirts and chatter of servants, had gone silent. Not the pregnant silence of fire night, but rather a trembling quiet that made me want. To scramble under the table. Or just start running. Lucian swore and drew his sword. Get fair to the window, by the curtains, Tamlin growled to Lucian, not taking his eyes off the open doors. Lucian's hand gripped my elbow, dragging me out of my chair. What's, I started, but Tamlin growled again, the sound echoing through the room. 
I snatched one of the knives off the table and let Lucian lead me to the window, where he pushed me against the velvet drapes. I wanted to ask why he didn't bother hiding me behind them, but the fox-masked fairy just pressed his back into me, pinning me between him and the wall. The tang of magic shoved itself up my nostrils. Though his sword was pointed at the floor, Lucian's grip tightened on it until his knuckles turned white. Magic, a glamour. To conceal me, to make me a part of Lucian, invisible, hidden by the fairy's magic and scent. I peered over his shoulder at Tamlin, who took a long breath and sheathed his claws and fangs, his baldric of knives appearing from thin air across his chest. But he didn't draw any of the knives as he righted his chair and slouched in it, picking at his nails. As if nothing were happening. But someone was coming, someone awful enough to frighten them, someone who would want to hurt me if they knew I was here. The hissing voice of the adder slithered through my memory. There were worse creatures than it, Tamlin had told me. Worse than the Naga, and the Surreal, and the Bog, too. Footsteps sounded from the hall. Even, strolling, casual. Tamlin continued cleaning his nails, and in front of me, Lucian assumed a position of appearing to be looking out the window. The footsteps grew louder, the scuff of boots on marble tiles. And then he appeared. No mask. He, like the adder, belonged to something else. Someone else. And worse. I'd met him before. He'd saved me from those three fairies on fire. Night. With steps that were too graceful, too feline, he approached the dining table and stopped a few yards from the high lord. He was exactly as I remembered him, with his fine, rich clothing cloaked in tendrils of night an ebony tunic brocaded with gold and silver, dark pants, and black boots that went to his knees. I'd never dared to paint him, and now knew I would never have the nerve to. Hi Lord, the stranger crooned, inclining his head slightly. Not a bow. Tamlin remained seated. With his back to me, I couldn't see his face, but Tamlin's voice was laced with the promise of violence as he said, What do you want, Resan? Reesan smiled, heartbreaking in its beauty, and put a hand on his chest. Reesan? Come now, Tamlin. I don't see you for forty-nine years, and you start calling me Reesan? Only my prisoners and my enemies call me that. His grin widened as he finished, and something in his countenance turned feral and deadly, more so than I'd ever seen Tamlin look. Reesan turned, and I held my breath as he ran an eye over Lucian. A fox mask. Appropriate for you, Lucian. Go to hell, Rhys, Lucian snapped. Always a pleasure dealing with the rabble, Reesan said, and faced Tamlin again. I still didn't breathe. I hope I wasn't interrupting. We were in the middle of lunch, Tamlin said, his voice void of the warmth, to which. I'd become accustomed. The voice of the High Lord. It turned my insides cold. Stimulating, Reesan purred. What are you doing here, Reese? Tamlin demanded, still in his seat. I wanted to check up on you. I wanted to see how you were faring. If you got my little present. Your present was unnecessary, but a nice reminder of the fun days, wasn't it? Reese clicked his tongue and surveyed the room. Almost half a century holed up in a country estate. I don't know how you managed it. But, he said, facing Tamlin again, you're such a stubborn bastard that this must have seemed like a paradise, compared to under the mountain. I suppose it is. I'm surprised, though, forty-nine years, and no attempts to save yourself or your lands. Even now that things are getting interesting again. There's nothing to be done, conceded Tamlin, his voice low. Recent approached Tamlin, each movement smooth as silk. His voice dropped into a whisper an erotic caress of sound that brought heat to my cheeks. What a pity that you must endure the brunt of it, Tamlin, and an even greater pity that you're so resigned to your fate. You might be stubborn, but this is pathetic. How different the High Lord is from the brutal warband leader of centuries ago. Lucian interrupted, what do you know about anything? You're just Amarantha's whore. Her whore I might be, but not without my reasons. I flinched as his voice wetted itself into an edge. At least I haven't bided my time among the hedges and flowers while the world has gone to hell. 
Lucian's sword rose slightly. If you think that's all I've been doing, you'll soon learn otherwise. Little Lucian. You certainly gave them something to talk about when you switched to spring. Such a sad thing, to see your lovely mother in perpetual mourning over losing you. Lucian pointed his sword at Rhysan. Watch your filthy mouth. Rhysan laughed, a lover's laugh, low and soft and intimate. Is that any way to speak to a high lord of Prithian? My heart stopped dead. That was why those fairies had run off on fire night. To cross him would have been suicide. And from the way darkness seemed to ripple from him, from those violet eyes that burned like stars. Come now, Tamlin, Rhysan said. Shouldn't you reprimand your lackey for speaking to me like that? I don't enforce rank in my court, Tamlin said. Still? Rhysan crossed his arms. But it's so entertaining when they grovel. I suppose your father never bothered to show you. This isn't the night court, Lucian hissed and you have no power here, so clear out. Amarantha's bed is growing cold. I tried not to breathe too loudly. Rhysan, he'd been the one to send that head. As a gift. I flinched. Was the night court where this woman, this Amarantha, was located, too? Rhysan snickered, but then he was upon Lucian, too fast for me to follow with my human eyes, growling in his face. Lucian pressed me into the wall with his back, hard enough that I stifled a cry as I was squished against the wood. I was slaughtering on the battlefield, before you were even born, Rhysan snarled. Then, as quickly as he had come, he withdrew, casual and careless. No, I would never dare to paint that dark, immortal grace, not in a hundred years. Besides, he said, stuffing his hands into his pockets, who do you think taught your beloved Tamlin the finer aspects of swords and females? You can't truly believe he learned everything in his father's little war camps. Tamlin rubbed his temples. Save it for another time, Reese. You'll see me soon enough. Reese and meandered toward the door. She's already preparing for you. Given your current state, I think I can safely report that you've already been broken and will reconsider her offer. Lucian's breath hitched as Rhysand passed the table. The High Lord of the Night Court ran a finger along the back of my chair, a casual gesture. I'm looking forward to seeing your face when you... Rhysand studied the table. Lucian went stick straight, pressing me harder against the wall. The table was still set for three, my half-eaten plate of food sitting right before him. Where's your guest? Rhysan asked, lifting my goblet and sniffing it before setting it down again. I sent them off, when I sensed your arrival, Tamlin lied coolly. Rhysan now faced the High Lord, and his perfect face was void of emotion before his brows rose. A flicker of excitement, perhaps even disbelief, flashed across his features, but he whipped his head to Lucian. Magic seared my nostrils, and I stared at Rhysan in undiluted terror as his face contorted with rage. You dare glamour me? he growled, his violet eyes burning as they bore into my own. Lucian just pressed me harder into the wall. Tamlin's chair groaned as it was shoved back. He rose, claws at the ready, deadlier than any of the knives strapped to him. Rhysan's face became a mask of calm fury as he stared and stared at me. I remember you, he purred. It seems like you ignored my warning to stay out of trouble. He turned to Tamlin. Who, pray tell, is your guest? My betrothed, Lucian answered. Oh? Here I was, thinking you still mourned your commoner lover after all these centuries, Rhysand said, stalking toward me. The sunlight didn't gleam on the metallic threads of his tunic, as if it balked from the darkness pulsing from him. Lucian spat at Rhysand's feet and shoved his sword between us. Rysan's venom-coated smile grew. You draw blood from me, Lucian, and you'll learn how quickly Amarantha's whore can make the entire autumn court bleed. Especially its darling lady. The color leached from Lucian's face, but he held his ground. It was Tamlin who answered. Put your sword down, Lucian. Rysan ran an eye over me. I knew you liked to stoop low with your lovers, Lucian but I never thought you'd actually dabble with mortal trash. My face burned. Lucian was trembling, with rage or fear or sorrow, 
I couldn't tell. The lady of the autumn court will be grieved indeed when she hears of her youngest son. If I were you, I'd keep your new pet well away from your father. Leave, Reese, Tamlin commanded, standing a few feet behind the high lord of the night court. And yet he didn't make a move to attack, despite the claws, despite Reese and still approaching me. Perhaps a battle between two high lords could tear this matter to its foundations, and leave only dust in its wake. Or perhaps, if Reesen was indeed this woman's lover, the retaliation from hurting him would be too great. Especially with the added burden of facing the blight. Reesen brushed Lucian aside as if he were a curtain. There was nothing between us now, and the air was sharp and cold. But Tamlin remained where he was, and Lucian didn't so much as blink as Reesen, with horrific gentleness, pried the knife from my hands and sent it scattering across the room. That won't do you any good, anyway, Reesen said to me. If you were wise, you would be screaming and running from this place, from these people. It's a wonder that you're still here, actually. My confusion must have been written across my face, for Reesen laughed loudly. Oh, she doesn't know, does she? I trembled, unable to find words or courage. You have seconds, Reese, Tamlin warned. Seconds to get out. If I were you, I wouldn't speak to me like that. Against my volition, my body straightened, every muscle going taut, my bones straining. Magic, but deeper than that. Power that seized everything inside me and took control, even my blood flowed where he willed it. I couldn't move. An invisible, talon-tipped hand scraped against my mind. And I knew. One push, one swipe of those mental claws and who I was would cease to exist. Let her go, Tamlin said, bristling, but didn't advance forward. A kind of panic had entered his eyes, and he glanced from me to Reesan. Enough. I'd forgotten that human minds are as easy to shatter as eggshells, Reesan said, and ran a finger across the base of my throat. I shuddered, my eyes burning. Look at how delightful she is, look how she's trying not to cry out in terror. It would be quick, I promise. Had I retained any semblance of control over my body, I might have vomited. She has the most delicious thoughts about you, Tamlin, he said. She's wondered about the feeling of your fingers on her thighs, between them, too. He chuckled. Even as he said my most private thoughts, even as I burned with outrage and shame, I trembled at the grip, still on my mind. Reesen turned to the High Lord. I'm curious. Why did she wonder if it would feel good to have you bite her breast the way you bit her neck? Let. Her. Go. Tamlin's face was twisted with such feral rage that it struck a different, deeper chord of terror in me. If it's any consolation, Reesen confided to him, she would have been the one for you, and you might have gotten away with it. A bit late, though. She's more stubborn than you are. Those invisible claws lazily caressed my mind again, then vanished. I sank to the floor, curling over my knees as I reeled in everything that I was, as I tried to keep from sobbing, from screaming, from emptying my stomach onto the floor. Amarantha will enjoy breaking her, Reesen observed to Tamlin. Almost as much as she'll enjoy watching you as she shatters her bit by bit. Tamlin was frozen, his arms, his claws, hanging limply at his side. I'd never seen him look like that. Please was all that Tamlin said. Please what? Reesen said, gently, coaxingly. Like a lover. Don't tell Amarantha about her, Tamlin said, his voice strained. And why not? As her whore, he said with a glance tossed in Lucian's direction, I should tell her everything. Please, Tamlin managed, as if it were difficult to breathe. Reesen pointed at the ground, and his smile became vicious. Beg, and I'll consider not telling Amarantha. Tamlin dropped to his knees and bowed his head. Lower. Tamlin pressed his forehead to the floor, his hand sliding along the floor, toward Rysan's boots. I could have wept with rage at the sight of Tamlin being forced to bow to someone, at the sight of my high lord being put so low. Rysan pointed at Lucian. You too, fox boy. Lucian's face was dark, but he lowered himself to his knees, then touched his head to the ground. I wished for the knife Reesen had chucked away, for anything with which to kill him. 
I stopped shaking long enough to hear Reese speak again. Are you doing this for your sake, or for hers? He pondered, then shrugged, as if he weren't forcing a high lord of Prithian to grovel. You're far too desperate, Tamlin. It's off-putting. Becoming high lord made you so boring. Are you going to tell Amarantha? Tamlin said, keeping his face on the floor. Resent smirked. Perhaps I'll tell her, perhaps I won't. In a flash of motion too fast for me to detect, Tamlin was on his feet, fangs dangerously close to Rysen's face. None of that, Rysen said, clicking his tongue and lightly shoving Tamlin away with a single hand. Not with a lady present. His eyes shifted to my face. What's your name, love? Giving him my name, and my family name, would lead only to more pain and suffering. He might very well find my family and drag them into Prithian to torment, just to amuse himself. But he could steal my name from my mind if I hesitated for too long. Keeping my mind blank and calm, I blurted the first name that came to mind, a village friend of my sister's whom I'd never spoken to and whose face I couldn't recall. Claire Better. My voice was nothing more than a gasp. Resen turned back to Tamlin, unfazed by the High Lord's proximity. Well, this was entertaining. The most fun I've had in ages, actually. I'm looking forward to seeing you three under the mountain. I'll give Amarantha your regards. Then Resen vanished into nothing, as if he'd stepped through a rip in the world. Leaving us alone in horrible, trembling silence. Chapter 27 I lay in bed, watching the pools of moonlight shift on the floor. It was an effort not to dwell on Tamlin's face as he ordered me and Lucian to leave and shut the door to the dining room. Had I not been so bent on piecing myself together, I might have stayed. Might have even asked Lucian about it, about everything. But, like the coward I was, I bolted to my room, where Alice was waiting, with a cup of molten chocolate. It was even more of an effort not to recall the roaring that rattled the chandelier or the cracking of shattering furniture that echoed through the house. I didn't go to dinner. I didn't want to know if there was a dining room to eat in. And I couldn't bring myself to paint. The house had been quiet for some time now, but the ripples of Tamlin's rage echoed through it, reverberating in the wood and stone and glass. I didn't want to think about all that Resen had said, didn't want to think about the looming storm of the blight or under the mountain, whatever it was called, and why I might be forced to go there. And Amarantha, at last a name to go with the female presence that stalked their lives. I shuddered each time I considered how deadly she must be to command the high lords of Prithian. To hold Rysan's leash and to make Tamlin beg to keep me hidden from her. The door creaked, and I jerked upright. Moonlight glimmered on gold, but my heart didn't ease as Tamlin shut the door and approached my bed. His steps were slow and heavy, and he didn't speak until he'd taken a seat on the edge of the mattress. I'm sorry, he said. His voice was hoarse and empty. It's fine, I lied, clenching the sheets in my hands. If I thought too long about it, I could still feel the claw-tipped caresses of Rysan's power scraping against my mind. It's not fine, he growled, and grabbed one of my hands, wrenching my fingers from the sheets. It's, he hung his head, sighing deeply as his hand tightened on mine. Fair. I wish, he shook his head and cleared his throat. I'm sending you home, fair. Something inside me splintered. What? I'm sending you home, he repeated, and though his words were stronger, louder. They trembled a bit. What about the terms of the treaty? I have taken on your life debt. Should someone come inquiring after the broken laws, I'll take responsibility for Andres's death. But you once said that there was no other loophole. The surreal said there was no, a snarl. If they have a problem with it, they can tell me. And wind up in ribbons. My chest caved in. Leaving, free. Did I do something wrong? He lifted my hand to press it to his lower cheek. He was so invitingly warm. You did nothing wrong. He turned his face to kiss my palm. You were perfect, he murmured onto my skin, then lowered my hand. Then why do I have to go? I yanked my hand away. Because there are, there are people who would hurt you, fair. 
hurt you because of what you are to me. I thought I would be able to handle them, to shield you from it, but after today. I can't. So you need to go home, far from here. You'll be safe there. I can hold my own, Anne. You can't, he said, and his voice wobbled. Because I can't. He seized my face in both hands. I can't even protect myself against them, against what's happening in Prithian. I felt every word as it passed from his mouth and onto my lips, a rush of hot, frantic air. Even if we stood against the blight, they would hunt you down, she would find a way to kill you. Amarantha. He bristled at the name, but nodded. Who is? When you get home, he cut in, don't tell anyone the truth about where you were, let them believe the glamour. Don't tell them who I am, don't tell them where you stayed. Her spies will be looking for you, I don't understand. I grabbed his forearm and squeezed it tight. Tell me, you have to go home, fair. Home. It wasn't my home, it was hell. I want to stay with you, I whispered, my voice breaking. Treaty or no treaty, blight or no blight. He ran a hand over his face. His fingers contracted when they met with his mask. I know. So let me. There's no debate, he snarled, and I glared at him. Don't you understand? He shot to his feet. Reese was the start of it. Do you want to be here when the Adder returns? Do you want to know what kind of creatures the Adder answers to? Things like the bog, and worse. Let me help you. No he paced before the bed. Didn't you read between the lines today? I hadn't, but I lifted my chin and crossed my arms. So you're sending me away because I'm useless in a fight? I'm sending you away because it makes me sick thinking about you in their hands. Silence fell, filled only by the sounds of his heavy breathing. He sank onto the bed and pressed the heels of his palms into his eyes. His words echoed through me, melting my anger, turning everything inside me watery and frail. How, how long do I have to go away for? He didn't reply. A week? No answer. A month? He shook his head slowly. My upper lip curled, but I forced myself into neutrality. A year? That much time away from him. I don't know. But not forever, right? Even if the blight spread to the spring court again, even if it could shred me apart. I would come back. He brushed the hair from my face. I shook him off. I suppose it'll be easier if I'm gone, I said, looking away from him. Who wants someone around who's so covered in thorns? Thorns? Thorny. Prickly. Sour. Contrary. He leaned forward and kissed me lightly. Not forever, he said onto my mouth. And though I knew it was a lie, I put my arms around his neck and kissed him. He pulled me onto his lap, holding me tightly against him as his lips parted mine. I became aware of every pore in my body when his tongue entered my mouth. Though the horror of Rysan's magic still tore at me, I pushed Tamlin onto the bed, straddling him, pinning him as if it would somehow keep me from leaving as if it would make time stop entirely. His hands rested on my hips, and their heat singed me through the thin silk of my nightgown. My hair fell around our faces, like a curtain. I couldn't kiss him fast enough, hard enough to express the rushing need within me. He growled softly and deftly flipped us over, spreading me beneath him as he wrenched his lips from my mouth and made a trail of kisses down my neck. My entire world constricted to the touch of his lips on my skin. Everything beyond them, beyond him, was a void of darkness and moonlight. My back arched as he reached the spot he'd once bitten, and I dragged my hands through his hair, savoring the silken smoothness. He traced the arc of my hip bones, lingering at the edge of my undergarments. My nightgown had become hitched around my waist, but I didn't care. I hooked my bare legs around his, running my feet down the hard muscles of his calves. He breathed my name onto my chest one of his hands exploring the plane of my torso, rising up to the slope of my breast. I trembled, anticipating the feel of his hand there, and his mouth found mine again as his fingers stopped just below. His kissing was slower this time, gentler. 
The fingertips of his other hand slipped beneath the waist of my undergarment, and I sucked in a breath. He hesitated at the sound, pulling back slightly. But I bit his lip in a silent command that had him growling into my mouth. With one long claw, he shredded through silk and lace, and my undergarment fell away in pieces. The claw retracted, and his kiss deepened as his finger slid between my legs, coaxing and teasing. I ground against his hand, yielding completely to the writhing wildness that had roared alive inside me, and breathed his name onto his skin. He paused again, his fingers retracting, but I grabbed him, pulling him farther on top of me. I wanted him now, I wanted the barriers of our clothing to vanish, I wanted to taste his sweat, wanted to become full of him. Don't stop, I gasped out. I, he said thickly, resting his brow, between my breasts as he shuddered. If we keep going, I won't be able to stop at all. I sat up and he watched me, hardly breathing. But I kept my eyes on his, my own breathing becoming steady as I raised my nightgown over my head and tossed it to the floor. Utterly naked before him, I watched his gaze travel to my bare breasts, peeked against the chill night, to my abdomen, to between my thighs. A ravenous, unyielding sort of hunger passed over his face. I bent a leg and slid it to the side, a silent invitation. He let out a low growl, and slowly, with predatory intent, raised his gaze, to mine again. The full force of that wild, unrelenting High Lord's power focused solely on me and I felt the storm contained beneath his skin, so capable of sweeping away everything I was, even in its lessened state. But I could trust him, trust myself to weather that mighty power. I could throw all that I was at him and he wouldn't balk. Give me everything, I breathed. He lunged, a beast freed of its tether. We were a tangle of limbs and teeth, and I tore at his clothes until they were on the floor, then tore at his skin until I marked him down his back, his arms. His claws were out, but devastatingly gentle on my hips as he slid down between my thighs and feasted on me, stopping only after I shuddered and fractured. I was moaning his name when he sheathed himself inside me in a powerful, slow thrust that had me splintering around him. We moved together, unending and wild and burning, and when I went over the edge the next time, he roared and went with me. I fell asleep in his arms, and when I awoke a few hours later, we made love again, lazily and intently, a slow-burning smolder to the wildfire of earlier. Once we were both spent, panting and sweat-slicked, we lay in silence for a time, and I breathed in the smell of him, earthy and crisp. I would never be able to capture that, never be able to paint the feel and taste of him, no matter how many times I tried, no matter how many colors I used. Tamlin traced idle circles on the plane of my stomach and murmured, We should sleep. You have a long journey tomorrow. Tomorrow? I sat upright, not at all minding my nakedness, not after he'd seen everything, tasted everything. His mouth was a hard line. At dawn. But it's. He sat up in a smooth motion. Please, fair. Please. Tamlin had bowed before Resan. For my sake. He shifted toward the edge of the bed. Where are you going? He looked over his shoulder at me. If I stay, you won't get any sleep. Stay, I said. I promise to keep my hands to myself. Lie, such an outright lie. He gave me a half-smile that told me he knew it, too, but nestled down, tugging me into his arms. I wrapped an arm around his waist and rested my head in the hollow of his shoulder. He idly stroked my hair. I didn't want to sleep, didn't want to lose a minute with him. But an immense exhaustion was pulling me away from consciousness, until all I knew was the touch of his fingers in my hair and the sounds of his breathing. I was leaving. Just when this place had become more than a sanctuary, when the command of the surreal had become a blessing and Tamlin far, far more than a savior or friend, I was leaving. It could be years until I saw this house again, years until I smelled his rose garden, until I saw those gold-flecked eyes. Home, this was home. As consciousness left me at last, I thought I heard him speak, his mouth close to my ear. I love you, he whispered, and kissed my brow. Thorns and all. He was gone when I awoke, and I was certain I had dreamed it.
Chapter 28 There wasn't much to my packing and farewells. I was somewhat surprised when Alice clothed me in an outfit very unlike my usual garb, frilly and confining and binding in all the wrong places. Some mortal fashion among the wealthy, no doubt. The dress was made up of layers of pale pink silk, accented with white and blue lace. Alice placed a short, lightweight jacket of white linen on me, and atop my head she angled an absurd little ivory hat, clearly for decoration. I half expected a parasol to go with it. I said as much to Alice, who clicked her tongue, shouldn't you be giving me a weepy farewell? I tugged at the lace gloves, useless and flimsy. I don't like goodbyes. If I could, I'd just walk out and not say anything. Alice gave me a long look. I don't like them, either. I went to the door, but despite myself, I said, I hope you get to be with your nephews again soon. Make the most of your freedom, was all she said. Downstairs, Lucian snorted at the sight of me. Those clothes are enough to convince me I never want to enter the human realm. I'm not sure the human realm would know what to do with you, I said. Lucian's smile was edged, his shoulders tight as he gave a sharp look behind me to where Tam was waiting in front of a gilded carriage. When he turned back, that medal I narrowed. I thought you were smarter than this. Goodbye to you, too, I said. Friend indeed. It wasn't my choice, or my fault that they'd kept the bulk of their conflict from me. Even if I could do nothing against the blight, or against the creatures, or against Amarantha, whoever she was. Lucian shook his head, his scar stark in the bright sun, and stalked toward Tamlin, despite the High Lord's warning growl. You're not even going to give her a few more days? Just a few, before you send her back to that human cesspit? Lucian demanded. This isn't up for debate, Tamlin snapped, pointing at the house. I'll see you at lunch. Lucian stared him down for a moment, spat on the ground, and stormed up the stairs. Tamlin didn't reprimand him. I might have thought more on Lucian's words, might have shouted a retort after him, but... My chest hollowed out as I faced Tamlin in front of the gilded carriage, my hands sweaty within the gloves. Remember what I told you, he said. I nodded, too busy memorizing the lines of his face to reply. Had he meant what I thought he'd said last night, that he loved me? I shifted, already aching in the little white pumps into which Alice had stuffed my poor feet. The mortal realm remains safe, for you, for your family. I nodded, wondering whether he might have tried to persuade me to leave our territory, to sail south, but understood that I would have refused to be so far from the wall, from him. That going back to my family was as far as I would allow to be sent from his side. My paintings, they're yours, I said, unable to come up with anything better to express how I felt, what it did to me to be sent away, and how terrified I was of the carriage looming behind me. He lifted my chin with a finger. I will see you again. He kissed me, and pulled away too quickly. I swallowed hard, fighting the burning in my eyes. I love you, fair. I turned before my vision blurred but he was immediately there, to help me into the opulent carriage. He watched me take my seat through the open door, his face a mask of calm. Ready? No, no, I wasn't ready, not after last night, not after all these months. But I nodded. If Reeson came back, if this Amarantha person was indeed such a threat that I would only be another body for Tamlin to defend. I needed to go. He shut the door, sealing me inside with a click that sounded through me. He leaned through the open window to caress my cheek, and I could have sworn that I felt my heart crack. The footman snapped the whip. Tamlin's fingers brushed my mouth. The carriage jolted as the six white horses started into a walk. I bit my lip to keep it from wobbling. Tamlin smiled at me one last time. I love you, he said, and stepped away. I should say it. I should say those words, but they got stuck in my throat, because, because of what he had to face, because he might not find me again despite his promise, because, because beneath it all, he was an immortal, and I would grow old and die. And maybe he meant it now, and perhaps last night had been as altering for him as it had been for me, but I would not become a burden to him. I would not become another weight pressing upon his shoulders. So I said nothing as the carriage moved. 
and I did not look back as we passed through the manor gates and into the forest beyond. Almost as soon as the carriage entered the woods, the sparkle of magic stuffed itself up my nose and I was dragged into a deep sleep. I was curious when I jerked awake, wondering why it had been at all necessary, but the air was full of the thunderous clopping of hooves against a flagstone path. Rubbing my eyes, I peered out the window to see a sloping drive lined with conical hedges and irises. I had never been here before. I took in as many details as I could as the carriage came to a stop before a chateau of white marble and emerald roofs, nearly as large as Tamlin's Manor. The faces of the approaching servants were unfamiliar, and I kept my face blank as I gripped the footman's hand and stepped out of the carriage. Human. He was utterly human, with his rounded ears, his ruddy face, his clothes. The other servants were human, too, all of them restless, not at all like the utter stillness with which the high fay held themselves. Unfinished, graceless creatures of earth and blood. The servants were eyeing me, but keeping back, shrinking away. Did I look so grand, then? I straightened at the flurry of motion and color that burst from the front doors. I recognized my sisters before they saw me. They approached, smoothing their fine dresses, their brows rising at the gilded carriage. That cracking, caved-in feeling in my chest worsened. Tamlin had said he'd taken care of my family, but this. Nesta spoke first, curtsying low. Ellen followed suit. Welcome to our home, Nesta said a bit flatly, her eyes on the ground. Lady. I let out a stark laugh. Nesta, I said, and she went rigid. I laughed again. Nesta, don't you recognize your own sister? Ellen gasped. Fair? She reached for me, but paused. What of Aunt Ripley, then? Is she, dead? That was the story, I remembered, that I'd gone to care for a long-lost, wealthy aunt. I nodded slowly. Nesta took in my clothes and carriage, the pearls that were woven into her gold-brown hair, gleaming in the sunlight. She left you her fortune, Nesta stated flatly. It wasn't a question. Fair, you should have told us. Ellen said, still gaping. Oh, how awful, and you had to endure losing her all on your own, you poor thing. Father will be devastated that he didn't get to pay his respects. Such, such simple things, relatives dying and fortunes being left and paying respect to the dead. And yet, yet, a weight I hadn't realized I'd still been carrying eased. These were the only things that worried them now. Why are you being so quiet? Nesta said, keeping her distance. I'd forgotten how cunning her eyes were, how cold. She'd been made differently, from something harder and stronger than bone and blood. She was as different from the humans around us as I had become. I'm glad to see how well your own fortunes have improved, I managed. What happened? The driver, glamoured to look human, no mask in sight, began unloading trunks for the footmen. I hadn't known Tamlin had sent me off with belongings. Ellen beamed, didn't you get our letters? She didn't remember, or maybe she'd never actually known, then, that I wouldn't have been able to read them, anyway. When I shook my head, she complained about the uselessness of the post and then said, oh, you'll never believe it. Almost a week after you went to care for Aunt Ripley, some stranger appeared at our door and asked father to invest his money for him. Father was hesitant because the offer was so good, but the stranger insisted, so father did it. He gave us a trunk of gold just for agreeing. Within a month, he doubled the man's investment, and then money started pouring in. And you know what? All those ships we lost were found in Barrett, complete with father's profits. Tamlin, Tamlin had done that for them. I ignored the growing hollowness in my chest. Fair, you look as dumbfounded as we were, Ellen said, hooking elbows with me. Come inside. We'll show you the house. We don't have a room decorated for you, because we thought you'd be with poor old Aunt Ripley for months yet, but we have so many bedrooms that you can sleep in a different one each night if you wish. I glanced over my shoulder at Nesta, who watched me with a carefully blank face. So she hadn't married Tomas Mandre, after all. Father will likely faint when he sees you, Ellen babbled on, 
patting my hand as she escorted me toward the main door. Oh, maybe he'll throw a ball in your honor, too. Nesta fell into step behind us, a quiet, stalking presence. I didn't want to know what she was thinking. I wasn't certain whether I should be furious or relieved that they'd gotten on so well without me, and whether Nesta was wondering the same. Horseshoes clop, and the carriage began ambling down the driveway, away from me, back to my true home, back to Tamlin. It took all my will to keep from running after it. Chapter 28 There wasn't much to my packing and farewells. I was somewhat surprised when Alice clothed me in an outfit very unlike my usual garb, frilly and confining and binding in all the wrong places. Some mortal fashion among the wealthy, no doubt. The dress was made up of layers of pale pink silk, accented with white and blue lace. Alice placed a short, lightweight jacket of white linen on me, and atop my head, she angled an absurd little ivory hat, clearly for decoration. I half expected a parasol to go with it. I said as much to Alice, who clicked her tongue, shouldn't you be giving me a weepy farewell? I tugged at the lace gloves, useless and flimsy. I don't like goodbyes. If I could, I'd just walk out and not say anything. Alice gave me a long look. I don't like them, either. I went to the door, but despite myself, I said, I hope you get to be with your nephews again soon. Make the most of your freedom, was all she said. Downstairs, Lucian snorted at the sight of me. Those clothes are enough to convince me I never want to enter the human realm. I'm not sure the human realm would know what to do with you, I said. Lucian's smile was edged, his shoulders tight as he gave a sharp look behind me to where Tam was waiting in front of a gilded carriage. When he turned back, that medal I narrowed. I thought you were smarter than this. Goodbye to you, too, I said. Friend indeed. It wasn't my choice, or my fault that they'd kept the bulk of their conflict from me. Even if I could do nothing against the Blight, or against the creatures, or against Amarantha, whoever she was. Lucian shook his head, his scar stark in the bright sun, and stalked toward Tamlin, despite the High Lord's warning growl. You're not even going to give her a few more days? Just a few, before you send her back to that human suspect? Lucian demanded. This isn't up for debate, Tamlin snapped, pointing at the house. I'll see you at lunch. Lucian stared him down for a moment, spat on the ground, and stormed up the stairs. Tamlin didn't reprimand him. I might have thought more on Lucian's words, might have shouted a retort after him, but... My chest hollowed out as I faced Tamlin in front of the gilded carriage, my hands sweaty within the gloves. Remember what I told you, he said. I nodded, too busy memorizing the lines of his face to reply. Had he meant what I thought he'd said last night, that he loved me? I shifted, already aching in the little white pumps into which Alice had stuffed my poor feet. The mortal realm remains safe, for you, for your family. I nodded, wondering whether he might have tried to persuade me to leave our territory, to sail south, but understood that I would have refused to be so far from the wall, from him. That going back to my family was as far as I would allow to be sent from his side. My paintings, they're yours, I said, unable to come up with anything better to express how I felt, what it did to me to be sent away, and how terrified I was of the carriage looming behind me. He lifted my chin with a finger. I will see you again. He kissed me, and pulled away too quickly. I swallowed hard, fighting the burning in my eyes. I love you, fair. I turned before my vision blurred, but he was immediately there, to help me into the opulent carriage. He watched me take my seat through the open door, his face a mask of calm. Ready? No, no, I wasn't ready, not after last night, not after all these months. But I nodded. If Reeson came back, if this Amarantha person was indeed such a threat that I would only be another body for Tamlin to defend. I needed to go. He shut the door, sealing me inside with a click that sounded through me. He leaned through the open window to caress my cheek, and I could have sworn that I felt my heart crack. The footman snapped the whip. Tamlin's fingers brushed my mouth. The carriage jolted as the six white horses started into a walk. I bit my lip to keep it from wobbling. 
Tamlin smiled at me one last time. I love you, he said, and stepped away. I should say it, I should say those words, but they got stuck in my throat, because, because of what he had to face, because he might not find me again despite his promise, because, because beneath it all, he was an immortal, and I would grow old and die. And maybe he meant it now, and perhaps last night had been as altering for him as it had been for me, but I would not become a burden to him. I would not become another weight pressing upon his shoulders. So I said nothing as the carriage moved. And I did not look back as we passed through the manor gates and into the forest beyond. Almost as soon as the carriage entered the woods, the sparkle of magic stuffed itself up my nose and I was dragged into a deep sleep. I was curious when I jerked awake, wondering why it had been at all necessary, but the air was full of the thunderous clopping of hooves against a flagstone path. Rubbing my eyes, I peered out the window to see a sloping drive lined with conical hedges and irises. I had never been here before. I took in as many details as I could as the carriage came to a stop before a chateau of white marble and emerald roofs, nearly as large as Tamlin's Manor. The faces of the approaching servants were unfamiliar, and I kept my face blank as I gripped the footman's hand and stepped out of the carriage. Human. He was utterly human, with his rounded ears, his ruddy face, his clothes. The other servants were human, too, all of them restless, not at all like the utter stillness with which the high fay held themselves. Unfinished, graceless creatures of earth and blood. The servants were eyeing me, but keeping back, shrinking away. Did I look so grand, then? I straightened at the flurry of motion and color that burst from the front doors. I recognized my sisters before they saw me. They approached, smoothing their fine dresses, their brows rising at the gilded carriage. That cracking, caved-in feeling in my chest worsened. Tamlin had said he'd taken care of my family, but this. Nesta spoke first, curtsying low. Ellen followed suit. Welcome to our home, Nesta said a bit flatly, her eyes on the ground. Lady. I let out a stark laugh. Nesta, I said, and she went rigid. I laughed again. Nesta, don't you recognize your own sister? Ellen gasped. Fair? She reached for me, but paused. What of Aunt Ripley, then? Is she, dead? That was the story, I remembered, that I'd gone to care for a long-lost, wealthy aunt. I nodded slowly. Nesta took in my clothes and carriage, the pearls that were woven into her gold-brown hair, gleaming in the sunlight. She left you her fortune, Nesta stated flatly. It wasn't a question. Fair, you should have told us. Ellen said, still gaping. Oh, how awful, and you had to endure losing her all on your own, you poor thing. Father will be devastated that he didn't get to pay his respects. Such, such simple things, relatives dying and fortunes being left and paying respect to the dead. And yet, yet, a weight I hadn't realized I'd still been carrying eased. These were the only things that worried them now. Why are you being so quiet? Nesta said, keeping her distance. I'd forgotten how cunning her eyes were, how cold. She'd been made differently, from something harder and stronger than bone and blood. She was as different from the humans around us as I had become. I'm glad to see how well your own fortunes have improved, I managed. What happened? The driver, glamoured to look human, no mask in sight, began unloading trunks for the footmen. I hadn't known Tamlin had sent me off with belongings. Ellen beamed, didn't you get our letters? She didn't remember, or maybe she'd never actually known, then, that I wouldn't have been able to read them, anyway. When I shook my head, she complained about the uselessness of the post and then said, oh, you'll never believe it. Almost a week after you went to care for Aunt Ripley, some stranger appeared at our door and asked Father to invest his money for him. Father was hesitant because the offer was so good, but the stranger insisted, so Father did it. He gave us a trunk of gold just for agreeing. Within a month, he doubled the man's investment, and then money started pouring in. And you know what? All those ships we lost were found in Barrett, complete with Father's profits. Tamlin, Tamlin had done that for them. 
I ignored the growing hollowness in my chest. Fair, you look as dumbfounded as we were, Ellen said, hooking elbows with me. Come inside. We'll show you the house. We don't have a room decorated for you, because we thought you'd be with poor old Aunt Ripley for months yet, but we have so many bedrooms that you can sleep in a different one each night if you wish. I glanced over my shoulder at Nesta, who watched me with a carefully blank face. So she hadn't married Tomas Mandre, after all. Father will likely faint when he sees you, Ellen babbled on, patting my hand as she escorted me toward the main door. Oh, maybe he'll throw a ball in your honor, too. Nesta fell into step behind us, a quiet, stalking presence. I didn't want to know what she was thinking. I wasn't certain whether I should be furious or relieved that they'd gotten on so well without me, and whether Nesta was wondering the same. Horseshoes clopped, and the carriage began ambling down the driveway, away from me, back to my true home, back to Tamlin. It took all my will to keep from running after it. Chapter 29 Inventing stories about my time with Aunt Ripley required minimal effort, I read to her daily, she instructed me on deportment from her bedside, and I nursed her until she died in her sleep two weeks ago, leaving her fortune to me. And what a tremendous fortune it was, the trunks that accompanied me hadn't contained just clothing, several of them had been filled with gold and jewels. Not cut jewels either, but enormous, raw jewels that would pay for a thousand estates. My father was currently taking inventory of those jewels. He'd hold himself up in the office that overlooked the garden in which I was sitting beside Ellen in the grass. Through the window, I spied my father hunched over his desk, a little scale before him as he weighed an uncut ruby the size of a duck's egg. He was clear-eyed again, and moved with a sense of purpose, of vibrancy, that I hadn't seen since before the downfall. Even his limp was improved, made miraculously better by some tonic and a salva strange, passing healer had given him for free. I would have been forever grateful to Tamlin for that kindness alone. Gone were his hunched shoulders and downcast, misty eyes. My father smiled freely, laughed readily, and doted on Ellen, who in turn doted on him. Nesta, though, had been quiet and watchful, only giving Ellen answers not longer than a word or two. These bulbs, Ellen said, pointing with a gloved hand to a cluster of purple and white flowers, came all the way from the tulip fields of the continent. Father promised that next spring, he'll take me to see them. He claims that for mile after mile, there's nothing but these flowers. She patted the rich, dark soil. The little garden beneath the window was hers, every bloom and shrub had been picked and planted by her hand, she would allow no one else to care for it. Even the weeding and watering she did on her own. Though the servants did help her carry over the heavy watering cans, she admitted. She would have marveled, likely wept, at the gardens I'd become so accustomed to, at the flowers in perpetual bloom at the spring court. You should come with me, Ellen went on. Nesta won't go because she says she doesn't want to risk the sea crossing, but you and I. Oh, we'd have fun, wouldn't we? I glanced sidelong at her. My sister was beaming, content, prettier than I'd ever seen her, even in her simple muslin gardening dress. Her cheeks were flushed beneath her large, floppy hat. I think, I think I'd like to see the continent, I said. And it was true, I realized. There was so much of the world that I hadn't seen, hadn't ever thought about visiting. Hadn't ever been able to dream of visiting. I'm surprised you're so eager to go next spring, I said. Isn't that right in the middle of the season? The socialite season, which had ended a few weeks ago, apparently, full of parties and balls and luncheons and gossip, gossip, gossip. Ellen had told me all about it at dinner the night before hardly noticing that it was an effort for me to get down my food. So much of it was the same, the meat, the bread, the vegetables, and yet, it was ash in my mouth compared to what I'd consumed in Prithian. And I'm surprised you don't have a line of suitors out the door, begging for your hand. Ellen flushed, but plunged her little shovel into the ground to dig out a weed. Yes, well, there will always be other seasons. Nesta won't tell you, but this season was somewhat strange. In what way? She shrugged her slim shoulders. People acted as if we'd all just been ill for eight years, or had gone away to some distant country, not that we'd been a few villages over in that cottage. 
You think we dreamed it all up, what happened to us over those years? No one said a word about it. Did you think they would? If we were as rich as this house suggested, there were surely plenty of families willing to overlook the stain of our poverty, no, but it made me, made me wish for those years again, even with the hunger and cold. This house feels so big sometimes, and father is always busy, and Nesta, she looked over her shoulder to where my eldest sister stood by a gnarled mulberry tree, looking out over the flat expanse of our lands. She'd barely spoken to me the night before, and not at all during breakfast. I'd been surprised when she joined us outside, even if she'd stayed by the tree this whole time. Nesta didn't finish the season. She wouldn't tell me why. She began refusing every invitation, she hardly talks to anyone, and I feel wretched when my friends pay a visit, because she makes them so uncomfortable when she stares at them in that way of hers, Ellen sighed. Maybe you could talk to her. I contemplated telling Ellen that Nesta and I hadn't had a civil conversation in years, but then Ellen added, she went to see you, you know. I blinked, my blood going a bit cold. What? Well, she was gone for only about a week, and she said that her carriage broke down, not halfway there, and it was easier to come back. But you wouldn't know, since you never got any of our letters. I looked over at Nesta, standing so still under the branches, the summer breeze rustling the skirts of her dress. Had she gone to see me? only to be turned back by whatever glamour magic Tamlin had cast on her? I turned back to the garden and caught Ellen staring at me. What? Ellen shook her head and went back to weeding. You just look so, different. You sound so different, too. Indeed, I hadn't quite believed my eyes when I'd passed a hall mirror last night. My face was still the same, but there was a glow about me, a kind of shimmering light that was nearly undetectable. I knew without a doubt that it was because of my time in Prithian, that all that magic had somehow rubbed off on me. I dreaded the day it would forever fade. Did something happen at Aunt Ripley's house? Ellen asked. Did you, meet someone? I shrugged and yanked at a weed nearby. Just good food and rest. Days passed. The shadow within me didn't lighten, and even the thought of painting was abhorrent. Instead, I spent most of my time with Ellen in her little garden, I was content to listen to her talk about every bud and bloom, about her plans to start another garden by the greenhouse, perhaps a vegetable garden, if she could learn enough about it over the next few months. She had come alive here, and her joy was infectious. There wasn't a servant or gardener who didn't smile at her, and even the brusque head cook found excuses to bring her plates of cookies and tarts at various points in the day. I marveled at it, actually, that those years of poverty hadn't stripped away that light from Ellen. Perhaps buried it a bit, but she was generous, loving, and kind, a woman I found myself proud to know, to call sister. My father finished counting my jewels and gold, I was an extraordinarily wealthy woman. I invested a small percentage of it in his business, and when I looked at the remaining behemoth sum, I had him draw me up several bags of money and set out. The manor was only three miles from our rundown cottage, and the road was familiar. I didn't mind when my hem became coated in mud from the sodden path. I savored hearing the wind in the trees and the sighing of the high grasses. If I drifted far enough into my memories, I could imagine myself walking alongside Tamlin through his woods. I had no reason to believe that I would see him any time soon, but I went to bed each night praying that I'd awaken to find myself in his manor or that I'd receive a message summoning me to his side. Even worse than my disappointment that no such thing had happened was the creeping, nagging fear that he was in danger, that Amarantha, whoever she was, would somehow hurt him. I love you. I could almost hear the words, almost hear him saying them, could almost see the sunlight glinting in his golden hair and the dazzling green of his eyes. I could almost feel his body pressed against mine, his fingers playing along my skin. I reached a bend in the road that I could have navigated in the dark, and there it was. So small, the cottage had been so small. Ellen's old flower garden was a wild tangle of weeds and blooms, and the ward markings were still etched on the stone threshold. The front door, shattered and broken the last time I'd seen it, had been replaced, but one of the circular window panes had become cracked, the interior was dark, the land undisturbed. 
I traced the invisible path I'd taken across the tall grass every morning from our front door, over the road, and then across the rolling field, all the way to that line of trees. The forest, my forest. It had seemed so terrifying once, so lethal and hungry and brutal. And now it just seemed, plain. Ordinary. I gazed again at that sad, dark house, the place that had been a prison. Ellen had said she missed it, and I wondered what she saw when she looked at the cottage, if she beheld not a prison but a shelter, a shelter from a world that had possessed so little good, but she tried to find it anyway, even if it had seemed foolish and useless to me. She had looked at it that cottage with hope, I had looked at it with nothing but hatred. And I knew which one of us had been stronger. Chapter 30 I had one task left to do, before I returned to my father's manor. The villagers who had once sneered at or ignored me instead gaped now, and a few stepped into my path to ask about my aunt, my fortune, on and on. I firmly, but politely refused, to fall into conversation with them, to give them anything to gossip over. But it still took me so long to reach the poor part of our village that I was fully drained by the time I knocked on the first dilapidated door. The impoverished of our village didn't ask questions when I handed them the little bags of silver and gold. They tried to refuse, some of them not even recognizing me, but I left the money anyway. It was the least I could do. As I walked back to my father's manor, I passed Tomas Mandre and his cronies lurking by the village fountain, chatting about some house that had burned down with its family trapped inside a week before and whether there was anything to loot from it. He gave me a too long look, his eyes roving freely over my body, with a half-smile I'd seen him give to the village girls a hundred times before. Why had Nesta changed her mind? I just stared him down and continued along. I was almost out of town when a woman's laugh flitted over the stones, and I turned a corner to come face to face with Isaac Hale, and a pretty, plump young woman who could only be his new wife. They were arm in arm, both smiling, both lit up from within. His smile faltered as he beheld me. Human, he seemed so human, with his gangly limbs, his simple handsomeness, but that smile he'd had moments before had transformed him into something more. His wife looked between us, perhaps a bit nervously, as if whatever she felt for him, the love I'd already seen shining, was so new, so unexpected, that she was still worried it would vanish. Carefully, Isaac inclined his head to me in greeting. He'd been a boy when I left, and yet this person who now approached me, whatever had blossomed with his wife, whatever was between them, it had made him into a man. Nothing, there was nothing in my chest, my soul, for him beyond a vague sense of gratitude. A few more steps had us passing each other. I smiled broadly at him, at them both, and bowed my head, wishing them well with my entire heart. The ball my father was throwing in my honor was in two days, and the house was already a flurry of activity. Such money being thrown away on things we'd never dreamed of having again, even for a moment. I would have begged him not to host it, but Ellen had taken charge of planning and finding me a last-minute dress, and it would only be for an evening. An evening of enduring the people who had shunned us and let us starve for years. The sun was near to setting as I stopped my work for the day, digging out a new square of earth for Ellen's next garden. The gardeners had been slightly horrified that another one of us had taken up the activity, as if we'd soon be doing all their work ourselves and would get rid of them. I reassured them I had no green thumb and just wanted something to do with my day. But I hadn't yet figured out what I would be doing with my week, or my month, or anything after that. If there was indeed a surge in the blight happening over the wall, if that Amarantha woman was sending out creatures to take advantage of it. It was hard not to dwell on that shadow in my heart, the shadow that trailed my every step. I hadn't felt like painting since I'd arrived and that place inside me where all those colors and shapes and lights had come from had become still and quiet and dull. Soon, I told myself. Soon I would purchase some paints and start again. I slid the shovel into the ground and set my foot atop it, resting for a moment. Perhaps the gardeners had just been horrified by the tunic and pants I'd scrounged up. One of them had even gone running to fetch me one of those big, floppy hats that Ellen wore. I wore it for their sake. My skin had already become tan and freckled for months roaming the spring court lands. I glanced at my hands, clutching the top of the shovel. 
calloused and flecked with scars, arcs of dirt under my nails. They'd surely be horrified when they beheld me splattered with paint. Even if you washed them, there'd be no hiding it, Nesta said behind me, coming over from that tree she liked to sit by. To fit in, you'd have to wear gloves and never take them off. She wore a simple, pale lavender muslin gown, her hair half up and billowing behind her in a sheet of gold brown. Beautiful, imperious, still as one of the high fae. Maybe I don't want to fit in with your social circles, I said, turning back to the shovel. Then why are you bothering to stay here? A sharp, cold question. I plunged the shovel deeper, my arms and back straining as I heaved up a pile of dark soil and grass. It's my home, isn't it? No, it's not, she said flatly. I slammed the shovel back into the earth. I think your home is somewhere very far away, I paused. I left the shovel in the ground and slowly turned to face her. Aunt Ripley is house, there is no Aunt Ripley. Nesta reached into her pocket and tossed something onto. The churned up earth. It was a chunk of wood, as if it had been ripped from something. Painted on its smooth. Surface was a pretty tangle of vines and foxglove. Foxglove painted in the wrong shade of blue. My breath hitched. All this time, all these months. Your beast's little trick didn't work on me, she said with quiet steel. Apparently, an iron will is all it takes to keep a glamour from digging in. So I had to watch as father and Ellen went from sobbing hysterics into nothing. I had to listen to them talk about how lucky it was for you to be taken to some made-up aunt's house, how some winter wind had shattered our door. And I thought I'd gone mad, but every time I did, I would look at that painted part of the table, then at the claw marks farther down, and know it wasn't in my head. I'd never heard of a glamour not working. But Nesta's mind was so entirely her own, she had put up such strong walls, of steel and iron and ash wood, that even a high lord's magic couldn't pierce them. Ellen said, said you went to visit me, though. That you tried. Nesta snorted, her face grave and full of that long-simmering anger that she could never master. He stole you away into the night, claiming some nonsense about the treaty. And then everything went on as if it had never happened. It wasn't right. None of it was right. My hand slackened at my sides. You went after me, I said. You went after me, too. Prithian. I got to the wall. I couldn't find a way through. I raised a shaking hand to my throat. You tracked two days there and two days back. Through the winter woods? She shrugged, looking at the sliver she'd pried from the table. I hired that mercenary from town to bring me a week after you were taken. With the money from your pelt. She was the only one who seemed like she would believe me. You did that, for me? Nesta's eyes, my eyes, our mother's eyes, met mine. It wasn't right, she said again. Tamlin had been wrong when we'd discussed whether my father would have ever come after me, he didn't possess the courage, the anger. If anything, he would have hired someone to do it for him. But Nesta had gone with that mercenary. My hateful, cold sister had been willing to brave Prithian to rescue me. What happened to Tomas Mandre? I asked, the word strangled. I realized he wouldn't have gone with me to save you from Prithian. And for her, with that raging, unrelenting heart, it would have been a line in the sand. I looked at my sister, really looked at her, at this woman who couldn't stomach the sycophants who now surrounded her, who had never spent a day in the forest, but had gone into wolf territory. Who had shrouded the loss of our mother, then our downfall, in icy rage and bitterness, because the anger had been a lifeline, the cruelty a release. But she had cared, beneath it, she had cared, and perhaps loved more fiercely than I could. Comprehend, more deeply and loyally. Tomas never deserved you anyway, I said softly. My sister didn't smile, but a light shone in her blue-gray eyes. Tell me everything that happened, she said, an order, not a request. So I did. And when I finished my story, Nesta merely stared at me for a long while, before asking me to teach her how to paint. Teaching Nesta to paint was about as pleasant as I had expected it to be, but at least it provided an excuse for us to avoid the busier parts of the house, which became more and more chaotic as my ball drew near. 
Supplies were easy enough to come by, but explaining how I painted, convincing Nesta to express what was in her mind, her heart. At the very least, she repeated my brushstrokes with a precise and solid hand. When we emerged from the quiet room we'd commandeered, both of us splattered in paint and smeared with charcoal, the chateau was finishing up its preparations. Colored glass lanterns lined the long drive, and inside, wreaths and garlands of every flower and color decorated every rail, every surface, every archway. Beautiful. Ellen had selected each flower herself and instructed the staff where to put them. Nesta and I slipped up the stairs, but as we reached the landing, my father and Ellen appeared below, arm in arm. Nesta's face tightened. My father murmured his praises to Ellen, who beamed at him and rested her head on his shoulder. And I was happy for them, for the comfort and ease of their lifestyle, for the contentment on both my father's and my sister's faces. Yes, they had their small sorrows, but both of them seemed so, relaxed. Nesta walked down the hall, and I followed her. There are days, Nesta said as she paused in front of the door to her room, across from mine, when I want to ask him if he remembers the years he almost let us starve to death. You spent every copper I could get, too, I reminded her. I knew you could always get more. And if you couldn't, then I wanted to see if he would ever try to do it himself, instead of carving those bits of wood. If he would actually go out and fight for us. I couldn't take care of us, not the way you did. I hated you for that. But I hated him more, I still do. Does he know? He's always known I hate him, even before we became poor. He let mother die, he had a fleet of ships at his disposal to sail across the world for a cure, or he could have hired men to go into Prithian and beg them for help. But he let her waste away. He loved her, he grieved for her. I didn't know what the truth was, perhaps both. He let her die. You would have gone to the ends of the earth, to save your high lord. My chest hollowed out again, but I merely said, yes, I would have, and slipped inside. My room to get ready. Chapter 31 The ball was a blur of waltzing and preening, a bejeweled aristos, of wine and toasts in my honor. I lingered at Nesta's side because she seemed to do a good job of scaring off the two curious suitors who wanted to know more about my fortune. But I tried to smile, if only for Ellen, who flitted about the room, personally greeting each guest and dancing, with all their important sons. But I kept thinking about what Nesta had said, about saving Tamlin. I'd known something was wrong. I'd known he was in trouble, not just with the blight on Prithian, but also that the forces gathering to destroy him were deadly, and yet, and yet I'd stopped looking for answers, stopped fighting it, glad, so selfishly glad, to be able to set down that savage, wild part of me that had only survived hour to hour. I'd let him send me home. I hadn't tried harder to piece together the information I'd gathered about the Blight or Amarantha, I hadn't tried to save him. I hadn't even told him I loved him. And Lucian? Lucian had known it, too, and shown it in his bitter words on my last day his disappointment in me. Two in the morning, and yet the party was showing no signs of slowing. My father held court with several other merchants and Aristo men, to whom I had been introduced, but whose names I'd instantly forgotten. Ellen was laughing among a circle of beautiful friends, flushed and brilliant. Nesta had silently left at midnight, and I didn't bother to say goodbye as I finally slipped upstairs. The following afternoon, bleary-eyed and quiet, we all gathered at the lunch table. I thanked my sister and father for the party, and dodged my father's inquiries regarding whether any of his friend's sons had caught my eye. The summer heat had arrived, and I propped my chin on a fist as I fanned myself. I'd slept fitfully in the heat last night. It was never too hot or too cold at Tamlin's estate. I'm thinking of buying the better land, my father was saying to Ellen, who was the only one of us listening to him. I heard a rumor it'll go up for sale soon, since none of the family survived, and it would be a good investment property. Perhaps one of you girls might build a house on it when you're ready, Ellen nodded interestedly, but I blinked. What happened to the betters? Oh, it was awful, Ellen said. Their house burned down, and everyone died. Well, they couldn't find Claire's body, 
but, she looked down at her plate. It happened in the dead of night, the family, their servants, everyone. The day before you came home to us, actually. Claire better, I said, slowly. Our friend, remember? Ellen said. I nodded, feeling Nesta's eyes on me. No, no, it couldn't be possible. It had to be a coincidence, had to be a coincidence, because the alternative, I had given that name, to Resan. And he had not forgotten it. My stomach turned over, and I fought against the nausea that roiled within me. Fair, my father asked. I put a shaking hand over my eyes, breathing in. What had happened? Not just at the betters, but at home, in Prithian? Fair, my father said again, and Nesta hissed at him, quiet. I pushed back against the guilt, the disgust, and terror. I had to get answers, had to know if it had been a coincidence, or if I might yet be able to save Claire. And if something had happened here, in the mortal realm, then the spring court, then those creatures Tamlin had been so frightened of, the blight that had infected magic, their lands. Fairies. They had come over the wall and left no trace behind. I lowered my hand and looked at Nesta. You must listen very carefully, I said to her, swallowing hard. Everything I have told you must remain a secret. You do not come looking for me. You do not speak my name again to anyone. What are you talking about, Fair? My father gaped at me from the end of the table. Ellen glanced between us, shitting in her seat, but Nesta held my gaze. Unflinching. I think something very bad might be happening in Prithian, I said softly. I'd never learned what warning signs Tamlin had instilled in their glamours to prod my family to run, but I wasn't going to risk relying solely on them. Not when Claire had been taken, her family murdered, because of me. Bile burned my throat. Prithian, my father and Ellen blurted. But Nesta held up a hand to silence them. I went on, if you won't leave, then hire guards, hire scouts to watch the wall, the forest. The village, too. I rose from my seat, the first sign of danger, the first rumor you hear of the wall being breached or even something being strange, you get on a ship and go. You sail far away, as far south as you can get, to some place the fairies would never desire. My father and Ellen began blinking, as if clearing some fog from their minds, as if emerging from a deep sleep. But Nesta followed me into the hall, up the stairs. The betters, she said. That was meant to be us. But you gave them a fake name, those wicked fairies, who threatened your high lord. I nodded, I could see the plans calculating in her eyes. Is there going to be an invasion? I don't know. I don't know what's happening. I was told that there was a kind of sickness that had made their powers weaken or go wild, a blight on the land that had damaged the safety of their borders and could kill people if it struck badly enough. They they said it was surging again, on the move. The last I heard, it wasn't near enough to harm our lands. But if the spring court is about to fall, then the blight has to be getting close, and Tamlin. Tamlin was one of the last bastions, keeping the other courts in check. The deadly courts. And I think he's in danger. I entered my room and began peeling off my gown. My sister helped me then opened the wardrobe to pull out a heavy tunic and pants and boots. I slipped into them and was braiding back my hair when she said, We don't need you here, fair. Do not look back. I tugged on my boots and went for the hunting knives I'd discreetly acquired while here. Father once told you to never come back, Nesta said, and I'm telling you now, we can take care of ourselves. Once I might have thought it was an insult but now I understood, understood what a gift she was offering me. I sheathed the knives at my side and slung a quiver of arrows across my back, none of them ash, before scooping up my bow. They can lie, I said, giving her information I hoped she would never need. Fairies can lie, and iron doesn't bother them one bit. But ash would, that seems to work. Take my money and buy a damned grove of it for Ellen to tend. Nesta shook her head, clutching her wrist, the bracelet of iron still there. What do you think you can even do to help? He's a high lord, you're just a human. That wasn't an insult, either. 
a question from a coolly calculating mind. I don't care, I admitted, at the door now, which I flung open. But I've got to try. Nesta remained in my room. She would not say goodbye, she hated farewells as much as I did. But I turned to my sister and said, there is a better world, Nesta. There is a better world out there, waiting for you to find it. And if I ever get the chance, if things are ever better, safer, I will find you again. It was all I could offer her. But Nesta squared her shoulders. Don't bother. I don't think I'd be particularly fond of fairies. I raised a brow. She went on with a slight shrug. Try to send word once it's safe. And if it ever is. Father and Ellen can have this place. I think I'd like to see what else is out there, what a woman might do with a fortune and a good name. No limits, I thought. There were no limits to what Nesta might do, what she might make of herself once she found a place to call her own. I prayed I would be lucky enough to someday see it. Ellen, to my surprise, had a horse, a satchel of food, and supplies ready when I hurried down the stairs. My father was nowhere in sight. But Ellen threw her arms around me, and, holding tightly, said, I remember, I remember all of it now. I wrapped my arms around her. Be on your guard. All of you. She nodded, tears in her eyes. I would have liked to see the continent with you, fair. I smiled at my sister, memorizing her lovely face, and wiped her tears away. Maybe someday, I said. Another promise that I'd be lucky to keep. Ellen was still crying as I spurred my horse and galloped down the drive. I didn't have it in me to say goodbye to my father once more. I rode all day and stopped only when it was too dark for me to see. Due north, that's where I would start and go until I hit the wall. I had to get back, had to see what had happened, had to tell Tamlin everything that was in my heart before it was too late. I rode all of the second day, slept fitfully, and was off before first light. On and on, through the summer forest, lush and dense and humming. Until an absolute silence fell. I slowed my horse to a careful walk and scanned the brush and trees ahead for any sign, any ripple. There was nothing. Nothing, and then. My horse bucked and shook her head, and it was all I could do to stay in the saddle as she refused to go forward. But still, there was nothing, no marker. Yet when I dismounted, hardly breathing as I put a hand out, I found that I could not pass. There, cleaving through the forest, was an invisible wall. But the fairies came and went through it, through holes, rumor claimed. So I led my horse down the line, tapping the wall every so often to make sure I hadn't veered away. It took me two days, and the night between them was more terrifying than any I'd experienced at the spring court. Two days, before I spied the mossy stones placed across from each other, a faint whirl, carved into them both. A gate. This time, when I mounted my horse and steered her between them, she obeyed. Magic stung my nostrils, zapping until my horse bucked again, but we were through. I knew these trees. I rode in silence, an arrow knocked and ready, the threats lurking in the forest far greater than those in the woods I'd just left. Tamlin might be furious, he might command me to turn around and go home. But I would tell him that I was going to help, tell him that I loved him and would fight for him, however I could, even if I had to tie him down to make him listen. I became so intent on contemplating how I might convince him not to start roaring that I didn't immediately notice the quiet, how the birds didn't sing, even as I drew closer to the manor itself, how the hedges of the estate looked in need of a trim. By the time I reached the gates, my mouth had gone dry. The gates were open, but the iron had been bent out of shape, as if mighty hands had wrenched them apart. Every step of the horse's hooves was too loud on the gravel path, and my stomach dropped further when I beheld the wide-open front doors. One of them hung at an angle, ripped off its top hinge. I dismounted, arrow still at the ready. But there was no need. Empty, it was utterly empty here. Like a tomb. Tam? I called. I bounded up the front steps and into the house. I rushed inside, swearing as I slid on a piece of broken porcelain, the remnants of a vase. Slowly, I turned in the front hall. 
It looked as if an army had marched through. Tapestries hung in shreds, the marble banister was fractured, and the chandeliers lay broken on the ground, reduced to mounds of shattered crystal. Tamlin? I shouted. Nothing. The windows had all been blown out. Lucian? No one answered. Tam? My voice echoed through the house, mocking me. Alone in the wreckage of the manor, I sank to my knees. He was gone. We hope you enjoyed the story. Please comment below about your experience so that we can improve and come with an interesting story. Please check out other parts of the story and thank you for being here. Please show some love by subscribing to our playbooks, community, and liking to our videos that gives us motivation. You can also suggest what will be our next story. Until then, stay tuned with us